All right, welcome everyone to our December uh, Juvenile Justice Advisory Group meeting. So excited to see everyone. Um, I know we have some new members. I'm so excited by uh, the opportunity to talk with our new members and to um, have an opportunity to introduce our new DCJS commissioner. Um, so uh, before, let's actually, so uh, we're gonna do our introductions first and then we're gonna get into our, um, getting to our, our usual business as JJAG in terms of um, our approval of, of our, our agenda and our minutes from our previous meeting. Um, so let's actually make sure we have our, yes. Uh, let's let's have a moment to have our new DCJS actually commissioner um, uh, have an opportunity to kind of introduce our, uh, themselves to our illustrious JJAG group that works so diligently, right, on so many variety of issues, and we're so excited to bring them on board. You go ahead and turn it over to Commissioner. Thank you. Good morning, um, and thank you for having me, and I'm so happy to see friendly faces I haven't seen in a while, like Sheila Poole and, and, uh, and Alan Riley, so <laughs> good to see you. You know, we're all staying, you know, close to home, uh, but it's wonderful to be here. Um, it's a pleasure to be with the rest of the Juvenile Justice Advisory Group today. I'm thrilled to have an opportunity to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, while I'm new to this agency, this is a full week today. I think today's Tuesday, so full week today. I made the first week. Um, I am not new uh, to government. Um, prior to coming here, um, I was Secretary of State for the last six years. Um, during that time, I worked on a wide range of initiatives that shared two common goals, um, which were to reform and improve our programs and policies for New Yorkers and to revitalize communities to make New York a more fair, equitable, and vibrant state. And as part of that work, I served as chair of the Council on Community uh, Reentry and Reintegration. This provided me with the opportunity to focus on issues facing justice involved individuals. We work closely with the governor's office. I, I was chairing that council even before I came to government. So I started doing the council in 2014. And because of the work we, we were able to do in the first two years, I agreed to come on board. Um, and we worked with uh, DCJS, local governments and community partners. And that was some of the most meaningful work because it allowed me to help reshape state policies and provide formerly incarcerated individuals with greater opportunities um, for success. Um, and for too long, our society has failed to recognize that the marginalization of justice involved individuals does more harm than good. It does harm to them, the individuals, but also to their families and also to our neighborhoods across the state. So I saw this, some of this I saw through my 30 year career as a media exec, as an editor, publisher and producer, um, through the lens of a journalist, I was moved by the stories of how society really treats its most vulnerable. And I was so drawn to this work that I left my CEO job and decided I'm going to look for a future in criminal justice. So I can say that, you know, my passion has led me here to DCJS. Um, it also led me to, to pursue a master's in criminal justice, which I did several years ago at John Jay and where I was actually teaching as a distinguished lecturer. So I've come full circle. At DC, as, as, as DCJS, it is our job to provide resources and services to advance the state's criminal justice system and ensure that it works fairly, equitably, and efficiently. To help ensure that our justice system evolves with the times and challenges we face, we all have to recognize the promise in each other the value in each other, most of all for me, the humanity in each other. So regardless of our jobs, our backgrounds, our role within our communities, you know, we're all New Yorkers who have chosen to serve others. And together we're stronger. Remembering that strength and rededicating ourselves to, to our service will help ensure integrity, trust, and any public confidence in every aspect of New York's criminal justice system. One of my favorite sayings is in my sign up to my emails is change is inevitable and growth is optional. And we thought 2020 had been a tough year and it was, but 2021 brought its own um, level of change and um, 
circumstances beyond, beyond our control, and yet here we are. Um, I and the professionals at DCJS stand ready to partner with all of you so that you, uh, so that together we may grow to, be, to better serve New Yorkers because they deserve nothing less. As we continue our efforts together, please don't hesitate to reach out to me and Executive Deputy Commissioner Joe Popkin, who's on with us today, or Deputy Commissioner Damone B, <laughs> who's also on today. Thank you for the opportunity to introduce myself, and I'm going to turn the meeting back over to the group. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Uh, and thank you for, for joining us. It's always great to have, um, the, the, thank you for sharing your sort of your background and your passion. And, you know, you, as, you'll, as you'll learn with this group, and uh, since you know many folks already, we're a very passionate group about juvenile justice reform for the state. So we're super excited to have your uh, participation here today. Uh, we also wanted to have an opportunity to also do introductions for some of our uh, some of our new JAG members. Um, we've um, there's been some movements. I know, as many JAG members know, there's been a um, uh, some, uh, we've been needing uh, sort of uh, the additions of new JAG members. So we want to have a moment for um, our new folks to kind of introduce themselves, and then we'll do a quick round of the current JAG members to kind of just give a, a quick. Uh, quick, quick sort of overview of who of themselves to uh, so that we all can at least have a sort of surface understanding of each other. Um, Tom, do you want to uh, uh, sort of call out our new JAG members? Sure, uh, absolutely. Yes, we have uh, three new JAG members, um, uh, one of whom you uh, know fairly well. It's uh, Nina Aldor from OCFS, um, and then two. Uh, who you may not be familiar with, but who have joined us. Uh, we have Heather Laforme, also from OCFS, who meets the new tribal representative requirement from the Juvenile Justice Reform Act, and Diana Palmer from uh, the Glens Falls City Council, who meets the locally elected official requirement. Um, so, you know, if we would like to, uh, in that order, maybe uh, have those three say a few words uh, of introduction, that would be great. I'll just jump in. I think most of I know most of the folks on this uh, screen. I'm Nina Allador. I'm a deputy commissioner here at the New York State Office of Children and Family Services over the Division of Youth Development and Partnerships for Success. Um, long history in juvenile and youth justice, longer than I think I'm going to admit um, on this call. Um, very, very excited to be um, now a voting member. Um, and I'm available to answer any questions, particularly my, my focus is on detention and really uh, the infusion of positive youth development um, into the way that we think about youth justice and youth justice reform. We have Heather next. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Heather LaForm. Uh, I am the director of the Office of Native American Services under OCFS. Um, and I am the tribal liaison to the nine tribal nations here in New York, um, mostly on child welfare matters, but there are a lot of other different issues that my office handles. Um, so I am excited to uh, really work with this group, um, especially on the uh, on the issues that you guys are all facing. Um, I did say, I just want to, I just want to point this out. I did look at the, the strategy plan and, and all of the previous documents. And I would do say, I'm a little disappointed that there's not, um, some numbers and data on native Americans. Um, I know we are a very small population in New York. We're about 2%. Um, so. Um, if there is like 3% of juvenile justice in the system, I mean, that's obviously that's a, a, a disproportionate number. So I am, I am available for any questions. Um, I will be um, watching for more data and, and, and how we can um, look at the American Indian Native American numbers. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome, Heather. And thank you for that notation. That's an important one. Uh, Diana. Hi everyone, I'm Diana Palmer. I'm a city council person in Glens Falls, New York. It's about an hour north of Albany, if, if any of you have, are unfamiliar. Um, 
I also am a therapist, um, I'm a marriage and family therapist. My background is in community mental health, but now I'm in private practice. I work with families in our community. Um, but before that, I worked in um, a lot of inpatient crisis residential treatment centers. Um, and I'm a recent graduate of Northeastern University where I got my doctorate in law and policy and my research was focused on armed protests. So I'm very excited to be here and to get to know all of you. Wonderful, welcome, welcome, Diana. Um, and to to just round it out, I think it'd be good for us as JAG members to also provide sort of a, a, a quick kind of um, introduction for our new members. Um, I will try to do it in a way where we can, uh, I'm going to just follow the line of who I see <laughs> um, as a way to kind of sort of expedite this. Um, I'll quickly introduce myself. My name is Addie Fergus. I am professor at Temple University, longtime resident in Yonkers, New York. Uh, my research work is around disproportionate suspensions and special education identification in schools. Um, I'm going to go next to the next person I see is Joe. Hi, this is Joe Cacosa. Um, my background is I'm a PhD sociologist, uh, primarily focused on research on juvenile justice and mental health. Uh, prior to retiring a number of years ago, I ran the National Center for Mental Health and Juvenile Justice. And before that, I worked for several decades uh, with the state, uh, initially within the Office of Mental Health doing research and then with the New York State Council on Children and Families, which I ended up directing for a number of years. Wonderful, thanks, Joe. Uh, next I have is Alan. Uh oh, Alan, I think you're still on mute. How's that? <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Good afternoon, good morning. My name is Alan Riley. I'm the chairman of the State Commission of Corrections. Uh, we deal with regulating the jails, uh, any custody place, uh, OCFS facilities, and uh, police lockups. Um, currently, um, before this, I was a, a New York State trooper and then the Madison County Sheriff for seven and a half years. And then here I am now as the chairman of the State Commission of Corrections. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, Brendan. Good morning, welcome aboard. My name is Brendan Cox. I am, my background is in law enforcement, so I'm currently the director of policing strategies for the LEAD Support Bureau, um, Law Enforcement Assistant Diversion. And prior to that, I was with the Albany Police Department for 23 years. Uh, I uh, retired there as chief back in uh, January 2017. So looking forward to uh, getting to know everybody. Great. Uh, next I have is Emily. Hi. Um, I'm Emily Tao. I am the president of the Tao Foundation. Uh, we're a foundation, a family foundation based in uh, Connecticut. And, and we, among other things, uh, we are very focused on funding in the youth and adult criminal justice and legal system area. And um, I, I have had a lot of involvement in New York's uh, work to create a state plan for the New York justice system way back and um, have really enjoyed being part of the JAG for a number of years now. Nice to meet you guys. And nice, thank, congratulations, Nina and Rosanna. So exciting. Wonderful. Um, the next I think I have is uh, Euphemia. Good morning, everyone. Happy holiday season. I am Euphemia Strawn, CEO and founding member of Families on the Move of New York City. We are a family and youth peer run agency that provides peer support services, technical assistance, trainings, workshops, and so on. I am the parent of two identical twin, I have identical twin sons who were both in the juvenile justice system and the criminal justice system. I am from Hollis, Queens, and I reside in Staten Island. And in um, undergraduate, I focused in black psychology. And when I was in grad school, although my 
major was administration and group work. I focused on post-traumatic slave dis dis um, disorder. All right, thank you. Um, Jason. It's like you're still on mute, Jason. Oh, he's like your mute button doesn't want to work for you. <laughs> All right, we'll come back to you, Jason. Oh, did it work? Okay. Um, next, I have uh, Judge Mendelson. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so nice to see you on my screen. My name is Edwina Richardson Mendelson. I serve as statewide Deputy Chief Administrative Judge for Justice Initiatives a long title with many duties. As it relates to JJAG, I oversee our Child Welfare Court Improvement Project, um, which is a federally mandated program to promote permanency well-being uh, and safety for children who are child welfare system involved. I oversee also many initiatives that um, involve our juvenile and emerging adult justice population and I uh, co-led our court system's implementation of the Raise the Age legislation. Um, I also oversee uh, the Division of Policy and Planning where we have 300, close to 350 problem solving and accountability courts. Those are our mental health courts, our uh, uh, substance use uh, courts, et cetera. Um, and I have a PhD in criminal justice since people are talking about their background. Um, <laughs> and so for this meeting, I can be Dr. Judge. <laughs> Um, and it's really a pleasure to be in this space with you all and to welcome the, those who are new and to see those who have been part of this work um, and this group for some time. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, uh, Jason, do you wanna try it again? Yeah, I'm good now. My laptop, we wanted every button to work except for the unmute. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my name is Jason Williams. Um, I've always had a passion for criminal justice. Um, I worked with a teacher in middle school to found a nonprofit organization called Too Young to Die in response to uh, my neighborhood and the climate of the time. Um, since then, uh, I had a run in with the law myself. Uh, and as a result of that, I was able to explain the difficulties that I had in life and that the whole process created and things of that nature and just explaining um, how people who may be in the system and may have come out may feel and try to get that whole point of view of cross i'm um, working with uh, nassau county's youth court as well as local nonprofits throughout new york city and albany uh to get the story and the word out wonderful thank you jason uh next i think um following this uh regent young Good morning. Uh, my name is Lester Young. Uh, I currently serve as the chancellor for the New York State Board of Regents. Uh, and uh, I'm sure everyone knows uh, what what we do, so I won't go into that. I'm a career educator, having held uh, just about every position one could hold in education from teacher on up through uh, deputy. Uh, I actually served as a superintendent and also at the state level. And um, I, I have a doctorate in uh, education leadership uh, with a focus on human development and leadership. Thank you. Um, next, I think I see is Meredith. Good morning. Uh, I'm Meredith Frey Labat. I'm the deputy director of the Children's Division here at the Office of Mental Health. Um, I have been with the Mental Health uh, Office of Mental Health for uh, more than 20 years now, um, having have um, received a master's in social work and criminal justice concurrently. Uh, when I started working here, I began working on 
uh, initiatives that crossed with both DCGS, uh, OPCA at the time, and um, Office of Pro uh, Probation and uh, OCFS around uh, juvenile justice initiatives and have done a number of them <laughs> over the years. Uh, and uh, it's been a long passion of mine to be able to divert children uh, who are in the juvenile justice system into needed mental health services um, uh, and get them in the right system to support them uh, and not uh, and avoid future uh, involvement in juvenile justice uh, and address their mental health needs. Wonderful. Uh, Michelle. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Michelle Diaz. My pronouns are she, her. Um, I am currently working with a not not for profit organization based in Oregon. Um, it's called National Curtain, and I serve as one of their directors. Um, I am also the national chairwoman for the Coalition for Juvenile Justice and a month other boards. I've been with the JJAC for about five years now. Um, and since everyone is giving their background, I'm gonna do the same. Um, I graduated uh, from John Jay with my bachelor's in criminal justice, and I am currently as well pursuing my my master's in public administration at John Jay. And you know, I'm just happy to be here with all of you. Wonderful. Um, next, I have is Naisha. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome for the ones that are just um, joining us. Um, let's see, my name is Naisha. Um, I'm based here in Buffalo, New York. Um, I've been with the JAG for a few years now. I'm a part of their youth members. Um, so I don't have a bunch of <laughs> experience like you all. Um, but I have worked closely with at risk youth, um, here in Buffalo. I've been doing that since I was a kid myself since I've been 18. Uh, so I have been doing that, and I think that would be my experience. I've graduated from Buffalo State with a background in political science, and I still continue the work with uh, local nonprofits here in Buffalo. Thank you. Next I have, oh, Sheila. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Eddie. My name is Sheila Poole. I am the commissioner of the New York State Office of Children and Family Services and um, a partner to many of you on the call. Our agency uh, works with so many of you and you've already heard two of my um, leaders here introduce themselves, Nina and Heather, who are happy to have uh, join as members. Um, and um, I always look forward to our time together. I'm excited about the new, new leadership and my friend, uh, Rosanna Rosado at DCJS. I think we have got such a great opportunity and hopefully with a deep sense of urgency because we have so much um, important work to do together. Wonderful. All right, so I think, um, Tom, if you can help me, I think that's everyone that, I, that uh, is here. Um, I don't see Bob. Hey, Bob any. couldn't make it today. Um, okay. And I haven't seen Karen or Precious. Yes. Hey. All right. So that may be all for our Jack members for today. Thank you all so much for the introductions and so much welcome for our new members. Um, let me take this off. Um, Sorry, I'm in the in the school in the principal's office, and there were people in the in the room. I have my headphones on, so now they're out of here, so I can take my mask off. Thank goodness. Um, so excited to have all of you join us, and I'm so uh, thankful for your the, the variety of experiences that you all bring. I I want to just highlight that um, this range of experiences I think is what really um, what I, I think has really brought forward into the strategic plan that I'm so looking forward to us talking through today. So let's get started with our, our, uh, our set of work for today. And we're gonna start first by, I'm gonna ask for a, um, uh, a motion to approve the agenda and minutes um, from our September meeting. So can I get a motion? Thank you, Joe. Can I get a second? All right, Brendan. 
um, all approve of the agenda and minutes from our September meeting. Um, raise your hand or approve or put a thumbs up. I, it's, it's, I'm still trying to figure out this thing, but I think I, I, think I saw the pro proportion of everyone <laughs> approving. Any, uh, any abstentions, just in case. All right, I think the thumbs up. I like the thumbs up. That's easily visual for me to see. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, all right, so let's move to our, um, our next big set of items on our agenda for today. Uh, we have our staff updates um, regarding the federal funding status, which we know that's uh, it's something we've been desperately needing. I think I, I think I saw Jeff at some point, um, and also regarding our Title II application. So, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Jeff Bender. I'm the Deputy Commissioner at DCGS over the Office of Program Development and Funding, and we handle sort of both sides of the Title II month. We're responsible for submitting the annual application and accepting the awards and making sure we're compliant with all of the award conditions in doing so. And then uh, my office also handles any local assistance contracts where we make awards and go to contract with local units of government or local not-for-profits. Um, so in looking over, you know, the, the charts that we customarily present at the meeting, I usually go off this chart with a black bar in the middle. It's a summary chart that was distributed as part of your package. Um, and um, we do have good news this year. Um, we have at long last, or uh, it's been trending positively, obviously for the last few meetings. Um, just last week we got um, written uh, notification from the Department of Justice that they agree that we are in compliance with the SAG membership requirements um, that were in place back in 2019, meaning that we can accept our FY 2019 award at long last. Um, and we're getting ready to draw those funds down now. Um, I, Tom has really been taking the bit on the front of this uh, interaction with the DOJ, and um, we're not quite there on 20. Starting in FY20, the standards changed, and we had and the requirements were increased. Um, I think we're almost there, but not quite there. Is that right, Tom? Um, to be able to move forward on 20 as well? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, we have two appointments pending. One for a victim advocate representative and an additional youth member uh, to satisfy the one fifth requirement by going over uh, 20 members. Okay. So once once we get there, that should we should be in a position to to um, go through the process of accepting all of the awards that we have, as, you, as the chart indicates with the, uh, the federal fiscal years on the left that have asterisks, those awards are uh, are in different states of delay, but in, in the next several months, we should be able to move through all of them actually and get ourselves under position to accept the 20 and, uh, and the 21 as well. So the chart shows available funding that's been granted to New York State through FY21. Um, that's the fiscal year that started, or the, the grant period started this past October 1st. So we're already into that. Um, you can see we've got total awards, um, aggregate of $12.6 million. That's right in the middle of the page. And, um, and we have made commitments, which are the, what are listed below the bar on the page. Um, and so those are the different commitments that we've made against the funds. And then on the top part, it shows you the remaining balance that has not yet been programmed, which is a total of $3.8 million, um, of which 2.7, at least 2.7 million has to be spent through local awards. And then the state ha can keep up to the 1.048 of what's remaining, or we have the option to also make local awards to that amount that the local share is a minimum. Um, so again, that's really good news. You can see this chart has simplified a bit over time as we've been taking on fewer small projects and concentrating on our larger initiatives. So it really is an easier presentation for me right now. And we haven't had a lot of new commitments of late and we don't have any to vote on today. Um, so it's, uh, it's just sort of a nice snapshot in time. It's nice to finally be able to move forward and start accepting our awards. And, um, and I open it for any questions. The virtual format is, you have these moments of stony silence, but I won't take it personally. All right, Eddie, I think you're, if there aren't any other, if you do have questions, you can always contact uh, myself or the other two folks, or there's uh, also from our team now, we have Maura Gagan, who's been with the JJAG for several years, and she's leading a team that includes Katie Nardalillo, who's new to the JJAG group, as well as Benedicta 
um, at a NUMMI who has been on it for the last several years is also. Wonderful. Thank you, Jeff, um, you know, uh, for providing this overview. And, and I want to concur with the, you know, the, the work that Tom's been, you know, moving forward around making sure that um, we're in compliance, particularly um, as those for JAG members who've been here, the, uh, the uh, dynamic that happened, you know, in prior years where um, we had to kind of contend with some of the um, uh, issues that came out of the um, administration at the time. So we're excited to be at this place. So Indeed. that being said, oh. Hello. Uh, all right, are we still, can everybody hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay, good. For some reason, everybody got frozen um, and isn't moving. So I'm just gonna presume that we are still a go. All right, so uh, next is the Title II application, the status update. Sure, I think uh, Jeff covered most of it here, um, but as everyone I think knows, we did submit our uh, FY21 application. Um, there, there is one additional caveat in that that OJJDP informed us about, um, and that is that uh, all states will be required to submit uh, resubmit compliance monitoring data using a new format that they uh, indicated that they will be releasing to us on December 15th. Um, so as soon as we receive that new format and the new guidance, we will be uh, getting to work on compiling and submitting the required information. I don't think we anticipate there to be any uh any issues with that it's just that they are changing the way that they are looking to collect the information so that is where we are at on that all right any questions all right uh, so Next on our agenda is an update regarding our youth action committee. So I believe is this Trista, I think, who's kicking us off. Uh, good morning, everyone. I um, I can, but I'm just going to do a quick pass on, I think, to Jason um, or Naija or Michelle. I'm going to let our young people speak um, for the work that they've done. Um, Quite honestly, and in my absence, as I was out on maternity leave for most of the summer, so um, I'm going to kick it over to them. So I'm not sure who's going to speak for you all, but um, the floor is yours, guys. So uh, with us being a relatively new group, uh, we've mainly been focusing on our foundations and what our goals we what goals we hope to achieve. Um, really to set ourselves apart. Um, so from our goals list, we have three goals that we have sought as of right now uh, to create and enhance preventative measures throughout New York communities. Also foster positive relationships between the JAG and the community through our involvement, as well as de developing the skill set of YAC members. Uh, our meetings are done biweekly on Thursdays. Everything is saved inside of our Google Drive so that everybody has access to whatever they need. Um, and our membership is myself, Michelle, Naija, Precious, and Trust as our liaison. Um, for our allocation of funds, um, we this is just a general plot for right now, uh, but we have a portion not to exceed 50% for nonprofit get grants targeting local nonprofits who would be able to make the most impact in local youth uh, in regards to uh, smaller communities or uh, a more specified area uh, just to measure the effectiveness of uh, any programs we're doing, uh, as well as uh, a portion not to exceed 30% for supporting events and seminars. Uh, that would also include uh, the possibility of us hosting any event and or seminar uh, in conjunction with any other groups with that leaving a portion not to exceed 20% for the professional development of the members 
uh, yak. Uh, that would mean uh, anything from us going to a seminar uh, or even uh, we've looked up into uh, courses you can take online like Udemy and Coursera, which are online courses for professional development uh, for a range. They're offered by colleges for a course of uh, subjects. Um, but that's all uh, for the consensus statement. And like I said, we're still building our basis, um, but I'll pass it off to any of the other members. Um, oh, everyone again, I think Jason pretty much covered it. Uh, like he said, we're still getting our footing. Uh, it's really hard virtually now because we can't really get together like the meetings how uh, we would prefer. Um, but yeah, I think we're still getting our footing in the ground. Um, yeah, I feel like Justin sums it up perfectly uh, with our goals and what we really want to do um, as youth members on the board and how we can make a change better or even make the bridge between the JJAG and the community, um, especially with our different um, towns that we all li live in. Um, so yeah. Thanks, thanks guys um, for presenting your work. And I know that um, we'll be getting really busy after the holiday season, likely to start moving forward with what you all want to accomplish and plan to propose for those specific funding ideas. Any questions for, for our Youth Advi Action Committee? They decided not to change the name. Sheila, I think uh, last time we joked about the name, they decided to keep it. So Youth Action Committee, unless they change their mind down the road. <laughs> Trisha, I have one question. For me or for the, for? For, for anyone. Uh, okay. First of all, I, you know, this looks great. It's nice to see this kind of action occurring. And the one question I have is in terms of the not-for-profit not, not grants, how are you gonna go about identifying the potential recipients and particularly in relationship to the grants that the overall JJAG board gives out. Uh, we were still, we're still like in the process of all that. Okay. Uh, any tips or suggestions would help, but we were hoping to use uh, any groups that we personally have worked with and groups that they may know of. Um, just uh, and hopefully put out a Google form so that then anybody can send a link to any organization they know of so they can all apply uh, online. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and I will just add any grants will have to follow the, the standard procurement guidelines and rules. And so when um, our youth action committee has decided sort of where they want to go and present the ideas to the full group, we will work at DCJS on our end to make sure that we're getting everything out in the way that it needs to go, um, depending upon dollar amounts and procurement rules. Um, so just um, wanted to follow that up to let you all know that we will be making sure that that is being done on our end. Thank you. If I'm able to add, I remember when we were founding the the Youth Empowerment Academy, one time I was able to sit down with Trista and be able to look at the applications and stuff like that. We're going to build some process like that as well, right? It's not just about giving money or to those that we know, um, but you know, as well, like we have to build the process of application, maybe interviews, follow ups and, and stuff like that. So we know that we are able to give the funds to the right people, to the right organizations that are out there. Excellent. Thank you, Michelle. All right. Thank you so much. Um, Youth Action Committee. I'm going to. Keep saying it that way because the yak just. Uh, <laughs> We're probably going to change the name. Like, okay. <laughs> like the yeah, the acronym you. has has sparked you to say we need to change the name. Yeah, we probably going to do that. <laughs> but I do so, agree that the but the the name is appropriate in terms of the youth action committee, right? Right. Uh, yeah. So thank you so much for this update. Um, and for those new JAG members, you know, this is a, uh, a set of dollars that we allocated in uh, earlier um, 
in our one of our meetings in terms of really sort of, uh, moving forward a set of work that the youth have really sort of outlined that is important for JAG to to, to not only support, but it's a cons very consistent with our strategic plan. So we're excited that this movement is happening. Uh, the next update is regarding the New York City Regional Youth Justice Team. I think we'll have Shalane um, kind of introduce uh, our, our partners there in uh, New York City. Sure, not a problem. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, so my, but for those that don't know, my name is Shalane Garcia. I'm a policy analyst in the Office of Youth Justice. I also serve as a liaison to three of the regional youth justice teams, including New York City, whom you'll hear from in a moment. So for those that don't know, we did allocate, the JAG did approve and allocate a set of dollars to the regional youth just each of the nine regional youth justice teams. And so today you'll hear about what, uh, occurred in New York City and what they used some of their dollars for, as well as what they're planning to use the remaining dollars for. Um, and I'm super excited about the project that they did because it was heavily focused on youth voice and using youth voice in order to inform the system's policies and procedures. So I'm going to turn it over to Courtney Ramirez, who is here um, on behalf of the New York City uh, Juvenile Justice Action Committee, um, which serves as the RYJT in New York City. So Courtney, thank you for joining us and take it away. Thank you. And I just wanted to say hello. It actually feels like a homecoming. I see a lot of familiar faces um, from many the JAG meeting, um, you know, where we sat around the table. Um, and so, you know, it's great to see everyone. Um, and I really am thankful for the opportunity to really talk about um, what we were able to do in New York City um, with your funding. Um, as Shalane said, um, our project, um, and Shalane, I'm not sure if you're going to pull up the slides or if people have them to look at. It, I can I can pull them up. Uh, I can pull them up from here. In front of them, that could be helpful. Yep. Uh, let's see here. I, I don't know if it's okay, this so one or the other one that you would want yeah. to pull up. Uh, no, that's the report. That's okay. the report. I think. Um, the and I encourage you to you know take a look at. Yep, I'll get it. Yeah. Hold on I encourage folks to take a look at the report when you get a chance. Um, what we did in New York City, um, as a as a JAG, we recognized that um, we did not have enough regular feedback and input um, from our young people, um, and you know, getting young people to participate in rather adult-like meetings that sometimes um, some of the adults at the table aren't quite sure why they're there and, and aren't necessarily interested because it could get a bit overwhelming. Um, we recognize there were other alternative ways to get youth voice into the mix. Um, and we recognize that, you know, oftentimes when we think about youth engagement, we think about youth development, we think about the impact on the young people themselves, um, you know, which is, is great. Um, but we also have to recognize that, you know, they play a very real role, as Shalane mentioned, in um, helping, or they should, in helping shape um, the way that we actually do business. And so we pulled together a collaborative um, of organizations in New York City, um, the Center for Community Alternatives, Youth Communications, Youth Rights, and the Kite. And we really concentrated on um, putting together a program um, where we can hear from young people um, through their writing um, and so that they can help shape um, information um, for us that we could incorporate into different training because our ultimate goal was to recognize that the folks who have the most regular contact with the young people um, while they're in our systems are our staff. And we needed to make sure that our staff were working from a perspective that was gender affirming, that was fair and equitable, that um, didn't um, uh, uh, continue um, to the cycle of what the experiences of a lot of young people may have been in the past. Um, we can go on to the next slide and just want to give you some, some project basics. So we received um, $150,000 grant of which we spent um, about 139,000 on the project, um, nearly 65% of which um, the funds went directly back to the young people, either through incentives and or to support their involvement in the program. Um, I will tell you that the program ran um, began in the spring of 2019 when we were kind of building the foundation in terms of the partners and developing the curriculum for staff to use and implement with young people. 
Um, um, but it ran through the summer of 2020. Um, and folks think about 2020 when the pandemic hit and it hit New York City hard. We did a lot of adaptations to make this project um, work. And one of them was um, shifting from face-to-face -face programming to virtual platforms. And so making sure that young people had access to participate, right? So whether that meant um, uh, supporting young people in, in phone cards so they can participate um, via Zoom through their own personal telephone. We were lucky in that um, a lot of young people who were still connected to schools, right, had access um, through remote learning, had access to um, tablets or, or laptop computers. And so they were able to participate as well um, because they had those things. But there were some um, young people who participated who had been previously disconnected from school and didn't have access um, to that type of equipment. So some of the funding also um, supported their involvement by making sure that they had the tools they needed um, to be to succeed. Um, and so basically through the project, um, we facilitated a number of writing workshops at, that were held across our secure detention, close to home, and um, our Passages Academy is um, our school for youth and placement. Um, in New York City. And so there were young people that participated in face-to-face -face writing workshops. Those happened initially. Um, we kicked it off from um, January of 2020 and then quickly realized we need to shift to virtual um, settings as well. Um, also, um, we had over 100 young people that participated um, in the summer of 2020 in a virtual writing project. Um, in June of, of the, um, excuse me, in, in June, um, we had heard that New York City was canceling its summer youth employment program. And we recognize that particularly in a time when um, we were in a pandemic and everyone was um, relegated to staying indoors, we needed to find opportunities for young people um, to be able to earn and learn and to be able to um, continue this project. And so um, we actually facilitated um, the writing project um, initially over a six week period of time um, where each young person was able to earn a $600 stipend, um, which doesn't sound like a lot because you think it's six weeks worth of time, but it was what we learned um, from the young people themselves in planning this was that it should be more um, young people should earn based on deliverables, right? Um, so each young person produced um, a project each week and received $100. For some, it may have taken them an hour or two, which would be great money. And for some, it may have taken them 10 or 12 hours. Um, and so, um, you know, each young person was able to learn, excuse me, able to earn, um, like I said, up to $600 for participation in the project. And although we intended to only last six weeks, the young people said, wait a minute, I want to work on my writing. I want to improve. Let's get, let's, you know, stretch this out. I need an extra week to do my writing. And so it ended up um, going for um, a full eight weeks, which was really interesting. Um, and young people who participated, we had folks who were in detention, who are in our placement um, facilities, who were in community-based program, who had transitioned home from detention or home from placement and were on aftercare. Um, what we found was there were a lot of young people who just liked the idea of staying connected to their peers. They were able to stay connected to staff who they wouldn't normally have been because we were able to do things on a virtual platform um, and share. And there was a lot of community building. And I will say another um, unanticipated outcome was, whereas when we do face-to-face -face programming, we rarely can um, mix young people from other facilities or even within, um, say, uh, uh, you know, one facility from other units. Um, we were able to um, bring people together virtually, and so we didn't have as many safety and security measures um, to be able to do this. And actually, let me go back. I will say this. We didn't use Zoom um, for those kids who were in facility. Um, we used a WebEx platform because we had to make sure we had certain measurements in places and protections, so that was only available to those who um, you know, community members couldn't just jump in um, into meetings, as we know, we have saw people Zoom bombing, you know, a lot of other meetings um, in the community. Um, in addition to those, we had young people who um, maybe weren't writers, but really wanted to share their experiences and thought there were some valuable lessons and tips that um, staff could uh, learn from. And so we had five young adults who had um, previous system experience. 
um, most had multiple systems experience, um, having been in foster care, many had been in RTCs or detention systems close to home. Some of them had been placed in um, with OCFS previously, and some had actually been in Rikers Island. They were all young people um, between the ages of um, that group of five were between the ages of 18 and 24, and they did video interviews um, conducted with um, at, at ACS. We have a James Satterway Academy, which is our training academy, and so. We, they actually interviewed with folks who develop and design the curriculum for new frontline staff coming in. Um, and so the staff were able to, you know, participate in these conversations um, with folks. They were able to develop um, um, snippets. I know there's a much more, there's a more technical word, but snippets of uh, interviews that are now incorporated into um, the onboarding of our new staff. Um, and I mentioned the training materials, the video um, pieces were um, some of what was developed. There is um, a full anthology of work from, um, we recognized, I'm sorry, let me back up for one second, um, more about this basics. We recognized that we started this project out um, to be about um, having a gender affirming um, body of staff and recognizing that we typically build juvenile justice systems around um, the needs and interests of young men. Um, and we needed to have a particular focus on young women. What we realized at the time that we have done such a great job in terms of um, kind of right-sizing our system and getting connected to programs and services um, in the community that we, we struggled um, at times with having collective groups of young women of which um, to kind of call information from and to work with. Um, you know, we don't wanna just, you know, utilize one or two young people um, over and over again for their expertise, right? Um, so what we did is we partnered with um, our child welfare side of the world at ACS. And um, what we did was we talked, we, we recruited young women who um, had had previous juvenile justice system experience. Unfortunately, right, a lot of our girls in our system have also been in foster care. And so we had um, a girls writing group that was community-based that was actually facilitated um, by a young adult who had um, previous systems experience herself. Um, and I also want to say um, of the grant project, very, very little of the, this grant was, I mean, as I mentioned, 75% went right into the kids, went to um, staffing the project. The only bit of um, staffing cost went to um, the administration and, and coordination of getting the stipends into the hands of the young people. Um, rather, what we did was we looked at, again, we're during a pandemic and people are working remotely. We had a lot of, you know, frontline programming staff who might have been assigned to work with our close to home placement facilities who were looking for how can I get connected to the facilities in which I'm assigned. So they came on board. Um, we actually had four um, creative mentors um, who were program staff who I'm happy to say that ACS has made a commitment um, whenever possible in um, Division for Youth and Family Justice, that if we have um, folks who have had systems experience who come from the communities in which they live, um, we hire them. And so our creative mentors were four young people who were all in their um, mid-20s who worked most closely um, to support the youth writers along with their frontline staff um, who worked in facility. We also had eight editors who were all, uh, excuse me, 18 to 24-year-old college students who had previous systems experience um, um, whether that be through juvenile justice or foster care. So they were able to kind of serve as role models as well to support um, their younger age peers through this process. And, you know, as a result of all of this work, um, we came up with, um, and I say we, but I really mean they, um, because I truly served more um, in the program management capacity and was not um, involved in the front lines. And I apologize because when Shalane recruited um, me to present or recruited the regional youth justice team to present at that at this meeting i think she was really more interested in hearing from the two staff who are most actively involved in the project and i just want to give their shout outs to Nasia harris and um edwin devalier um, because they're the folks who literally facilitated um virtual calls with young people two days a week first giving them a writing assignment um then kept coming back kind of working th um through a group process with them encouraging them to keep up the good work, um, monitoring the editors and making sure that young people produce a written product. We have um, produced um, a written anthology of the girls 
um, groups, which is very interesting. And we also have a PowerPoint of um, the virtual celebration that we had that includes many of the works that came from the young people, which included essays, poems. Um, we even had a young man who um, recorded a song um, in the, the, there's a sound studio um, in the facility, I think it was at Children's Village, where he was able to actually record um, a song, which was rather interesting in terms of giving us his thoughts about um, life in placement and ideas for systems improvement. And so, you know, I wanna just, and we can jump to the next slide and I'm gonna go through this quickly. I know I'm doing a lot of talking and I'm hoping that we'll have some time for, for questions or at least, um, you know, some thoughts about this. Um, I wanted to give you some project basics, but I think the real reason why um, New York City was excited about doing this project, and I think the real reason why the JAG looks to support and fund projects is to think about um, what are the lessons learned and how can we, you know, take efforts and, and do things to a larger scale. And so, you know, today I just want to talk to you a little bit about um, kind of what we learned and, you know, Hopefully, you know, you walk away today feeling I, I I get because I've listened to Trista, the young people on the call. I mean, it's great to meet um, folks and I'm happy that you have a full um, complement of, of, of young adults who participate in the JAG. That's fantastic. So I probably won't focus very much, if any, on educating why youth engagement is so important because I think you guys get it. Um, but I think that what we all need to do um, throughout every piece of, of what we're doing um, as we work in this system um, is to really evaluate our efforts, right? And to really look at, are we authentic in what we're offering and why we're offering um, um, things? We make a significant amount of investments. I listened to, you know, Jeff Bender talk about, you know, the $12 million that we're awarded and we invest in communities. Um, let's think about, you know, what kind of outcomes are we actually being able to report, you know, for on that inv investment, you know, that's a huge number um, that means a lot um, to, to young people and families. Um, and I also hope that folks walk away feeling empowered and, and recognizing there are different ways that you can support youth voice moving forward. And sometimes it just starts with the simple things. Um, we can just jump to the next um, slide which I literally will just skim over because I'm sure your youth members are very familiar with this and they can take the time to talk more with you and your, you know, and your colleagues um, about this. But I think that there are lots of times um, when we think that what we're doing with youth engagement is authentic. And my friend Michelle Diaz has, you know, reminded me on many occasions that most of the work that folks are doing um, when it talk, comes to youth engagement is on that lower um, rungs of the ladder, right? It, it, it kind of borders um, sometimes, I think, between three and four uh, in terms of tokenism or assigned, but um, but informed, right? We, we rarely have previously, and I'm thrilled because to even know that when I was at um, DCJS, we initially established um, a youth advisory council, just knowing even over the, I don't know, seven or eight years it's been, um, that it's advanced from an advisory capacity to an action um, capacity. So that's great. But I just wanted to let folks know that it's great to do youth work, but know that all of us have a long way to go than, you know, just bringing young people to the table. So, you know, that's more about, we can flip to the next um, slide. And, you know, I think, you know, in terms of being authentic in our efforts, we really need to be able um, to, to be able to answer some very basic questions um, if we're truly committed to positive outcomes for youth. Um, and I think that, you know, no one in this um, virtual meeting um, is interested in simply doling out money to local jurisdictions or coordinating statewide efforts if we're not actually having a positive impact on young people, right? It's, you know, that's our ultimate goal. And so the questions that we really need to think about is you know how well do we know our target populations are we offering the programs and services that young people need most and what kind of support are we actually giving young people as they transition out of our system and so you know i just want you can um click to the next slide um and uh, just so you know all of the material in this um presentation all came directly from culling information from the young people who wrote or shared information through interviews or 
uh, or, or, you know, artistic materials. And so when they talked about this, who is the target population? When we're responding to our, you know, um, our, our federal funding applications, there's a section, who's our target population? So in traditional sense, we're thinking about a certain age range. We're thinking about, you know, um, a certain geographic location oftentimes. Maybe we're talking specifically, it's a school-based program. But, you know, I think there's a lot deeper that we need to get in truly understanding, you know, what communities do these youth come from? Not just zip codes or census tracts. What do those communities actually look like? What resources do young people have available um, easily to them? And so, example, if, you know, if we know a young person might have more positive outcomes um, through a court process, if they're able to show that they're working or they're engaged in after school programming, you know, someone needs to focus on recognizing, are there even opportunities available for that young person to have a job? And, you know, I think from the New York City perspective, because this is where, you know, I'm currently working. And so we look at, you know, what's in the borough, what, you know, what neighborhoods. But when we th think about the diverse um, jurisdictions across the state, we have to think about, is there transportation available for that young person to participate in an after school activity or get to a job, right? And so we need to be able to create those kind of opportunities. In addition to, you know, the general sense of kind of where the kids come from, you know, um, in, in terms of their neighborhood, you know, also thinking about what does home look like? We have a lot of, you know, emphasis and we understand why there's a lot of emphasis on family-based programming. Unfortunately, you know, we have a lot, a lot of young people who are cross systems youth, right? Who do, are we engaging their foster parents in the family therapy work if that is part of the model, right? Um, are we recognizing that some of the young people particularly through raise the age, right? We have young people who are, you know, 18 and 19 years old transitioning home from placement. You know, are we recognizing that home might be very different? We need to look at more independent um, living skills and preparing young people for that. Also thinking about what are their interests, their talents, and even their triggers, right? And that's very, very important in, I mean, the work that we do. And again, I know that a lot of this is probably not brand new, but I think it's getting us to think differently. And that was all, you know, triggered from the young people themselves in terms of teaching us as adults how we can um, do a better job in the work that we do. You can click ahead. Um, and so, you know, the second question was about, are we actually offering programs and services that meet the young people's needs? Why are we supporting and funding and delivering um, the types of programs that we are? Um, you know, what actual impact are we having? How are we measuring success? what positive outcomes we can report. Oftentimes we report outputs. We had 32 participants, right? What is the result or what is the impact on the 32 participants? Oftentimes we don't ask those questions, right? We don't look at things over longer periods of time. And, you know, sometimes, you know, we, we, we're faced with, well, it's a challenge. There's how are we gonna be able to measure, you know, um, things over the long haul? Well, there's a lot of coordination of care through different systems. You know, there's different ways to match. And I know the folks in the research, right, department at, at DCJS have, have worked with other agencies to match, but even at the local level. And sometimes it doesn't even have to be all that advanced. It's, wow, I've seen that face before. I've seen that name before, right? Well, like you can start to measure and go back and look at how many times has this young person come through the doors of detention? Is he or she a frequent flyer? Right? Are they also in our foster care system? You know, if we if the, if they were involved in an alternative detention program and it was a successful completion, how successful? You know, what does that mean? Right. So these are all the types of questions. Um, and and I say that types because this was really about the young people themselves not knowing what exactly the the actual question should be for us as the system stakeholders, but knowing there's lots of things that you're expecting me to do that you're asking my family to participate in, but why? What are you hoping is gonna be different as a result of this? And you know, the question about are the gaps in services and unmet needs, are, you know, what are we doing for them? Here, there's a reality, I, I'm working closely with a, a project here in New York City that's really looking at the length of stay of young people in placement. And we have some young people that stay in care longer because people are fearful of, what will happen to them if we send them back home to their communities? Because maybe they have previous um, gang involvement, because the community is, you know, is suffering from a lot of violence 
Um, and, and, and it doesn't really make sense for a kid to sit, remain in care. And so we need to really think about what kind of programs and services are we offering? Yes, having linking up with mentoring programs is great, but there's got to be um, more that we're offering to them. And who are the experts in knowing what they are experiencing, what their needs are, and what they would be interested in participating, and perhaps what we should fund the young people themselves. So you know, a lot of those ideas came from um, the young people in terms of what types of things we should be offering. Um, we can flick to the next slide. Um, so a lot of the young people also talked about, listen, I have made big changes while I'm here, right? Like I didn't recognize that I could use exercising as a, as a coping mechanism. And I really enjoy that structured time and working with a, a staff member who's like supporting me and encouraging me. And I would love to participate in, in, in programs like this in my community. Again, how do we help them access those ongoing supports and resources, whether they're that physical type of program, whether it's a, an opportunity to earn excuse me, um, a couple dollars because we've incentivized them for some program activity, whether it's um, maintaining therapeutic services. Um, lots of times, particularly like for kids in placement, we work through them through a period of aftercare. Well, I mean, I think ultimately we all know that you're the significant behavior change is gonna happen for that young person in the family when they're doing the work beyond the period of when it's mandated by a court system, right? It's when they recognize themselves the value in it and how that's helping them to maintain a different lifestyle. And so we need to think about truly, you know, how we are able to manage that. Um, you know, continuity of care is a phrase that lots of folks use. And, and one of the things that the young people really taught us is that there are a lot of catchphrases, but when we actually dig a little bit deeper into how they are implemented, there's a lot of room for improvements. Right. And so we want to think about, you know, if most of us at different points along the continuum within a community are utilizing contracted vendors to come in to provide therapeutic services, per se, can we really try to concentrate on maintaining that same relationship with a counselor or a therapist? over the period of time once the young person goes home, rather than that young person feeling like every day is day one, right? And I have to continue to tell my story over and over and over again, and that leads to my frustration and my belief that there's not a value to this type of intervention. And so those are the types of things that we are hearing from young people um, that we as um, system stakeholders really need to think more um, intentionally about. Um, we could switch to the next slide. Um, and along the lines of the transitioning um, home and supporting young people and families beyond their time um, with, it, with formal uh, juvenile justice system contact, they talked about a plethora of um, supports and needs that, you know, um, could help them along the way. And so you see everything on here, you know, from some of the things I've talked about prior, um, but educational employment opportunities, access to housing, you know, support in navigating new systems, support groups, access to their own personal documents and reproductive health care. Some of the basic things that we know we would provide and ensure that our own children were provided with if we were truly um, committed to their long term success. Now, oftentimes, I think jurisdictions like ours struggle with, but we don't have funding to do all of these things. You're right, we don't, but there are so many other, um, uh, whether they're governmental organizations or community-based nonprofits, other folks who are funded and have resources to meet some of these needs. Um, and so I think it's time that we you know, you know, stop treating young people um, you know, as if they're in silos Right, and, and really look at them as comprehensive youth because that's part of the frustration too. The young people don't know if they're going to probation or ACS or DYCD or whatever other you know organization. They just know somebody told them they need to go there and they do not understand why we don't talk to each other and why um, oftentimes, I'll be honest, I think we don't do the best job in being effect in effectively utilizing our resources. And so we're you know kind of falling all over each other um, and that doesn't help anybody. So the next slide um, is really about, um, you know, 
basically when you walk away from this, I'm hoping that some of the questions that I've presented, um, and again, I wanna highlight based on what the young people brought forward, we want you to kind of, hopefully it's kind of made you think um, about different things. And I really would love for folks to really take a closer look um, at the report's recommendations. And there's, you know, a significant number of themes in um, the report that I think, you know, make sense. And I'll give you an example. You know, one of the themes that the young people um, really talk about a lot was that safety is a precondition for change, right? If you expect me to change my behavior, and I'll take it to, let's look at, say, um, behavioral incidences or fighting um, within a detention facility, right? We, 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 we see a fight, we count the incident, you know, we, we, we have some kind of intervention, um, but we, do we recognize that some of the young people are engaging in behavioral incidences because they fear for their own safety, right? And so, you know, we have to better understand what's happening and what their thoughts and ideas are about. And we heard from young people who said, you know, there could be a much better way to introduce new people into a unit or into a hall when they first come on board. You know, sometimes it's I have a direct knowledge of that person in the street and we had a, you know, a tough time. But a lot of times it's like, I don't know you and I'm gonna get you before you get me because this whole place is is is, you know, scary and 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 whatnot. And so I think that, you know, there's a lot of things that, you know, you could benefit from from taking a deeper dive into the report and the recommendations. But, you know, for today, you know, I think I would challenge folks, you know, you can start with something small and just be consistent. We jump into a lot of conversations about juvenile justice issues um, focused on data, focused on problems, the number of arrests, the number of incidences, recidivism, and we rarely start with a place of youth success, right? And, and I liked you know, what, what Nina Allendor said earlier on this call in terms of the combination of looking at juvenile justice from a youth development perspective. I think that we've had a lot of catchphrases um, over the years, we're trauma informed, although we most of us don't know what trauma looks like when it's staring you in the face, right? Trauma looks like disrespect. It looks like isolation. It looks like get out of my face, right? Um, as well as, you know, we say we are about youth development and youth development is all about strength based and recognizing young people's talents and giving them opportunities while also looking at ways that they can build upon those areas that are challenging. And so, I would encourage you again to do something small and it could be as simple as starting a meeting off with saying something positive about a success, whether it's an individual story, a great program that's happening, just so that we can keep our, um, our eyes and our mind focused on where we want to be, which is those positive outcomes um, for young people. Um, so I wanna, I, I think I'll just switch gears really quickly to talk about um, where we are at now. Um, and that is that this project was never intended to be an ongoing um, project in terms of the regular writing with young people. We have encouraged um, all of our um, facility staff and, and contracted providers um, to think about. Um, oftentimes we have these um, circle ups and we have opportunities for young people to share verbally, but think about how they can um, continue writing um, activities to support young people's, um, you know, positive growth and, and whatnot. But this project, again, was really focused on the staff development. So we worked with the kids, we developed some materials, where we've integrated um, a lot of what we've learned into the way that we do business. We have some young people from this who were engaged in this project at different levels um, who are now working. Um, they're members of our agency's Youth Leadership Council and um, are actually um, have been onboarded as um, regular consultants who review policy, who give feedback, um, all of that. Um, but really it's about implementing what we've learned in ways with our staff and recognizing that um, we still have a lot of work to do. And because we're you know, a public facing agency, we have an obligation to the community to make sure that we are responding really to the needs of our constituents. So that's really where we are with this project. We can um, switch to the next slide. Um, and I'll just tell you a little bit more about where we are currently. And we are forever grateful for the additional 100,000 um, that the JAG has um, granted to us in New York City. Um, as you can imagine, when we were doing the youth focused project, there was a lot of talk about that's great, but what about family voice and what's going on with families and what, what can we do um, as a result with that? And we we're like, well, Let's put that on pause for a minute 
let's get through this project and think. Um, but I'll tell you, again, you know, I talked about the this uh, Youth Voices project had to shift gears because of the pandemic. Um, something else happened during the pandemic in New York City. Um, as people were mandated to stay inside their homes, um, we saw an influx of family offense cases, right? Young people who were being arrested um, for incidences that were happening within their house. Um, a lot of times I think that, you know, people interchangeably use terms like family violence, family conflict, family offense. Very few of these cases actually involved any physical altercation, by the way. Um, oftentimes it was, you know, the throwing of a cell phone, breaking of something, somebody just feeling too frustrated and raising the voice and feeling physically threatened, although there may have not been contact. Um, all of which are huge issues. And I'm not saying that parents don't need um, support in helping to manage those types of incidences. However, um, I think there were a lot of folks who, if they felt that they had someone else to call, another way to manage the incident, um, those families would have preferred not to have their children arrested. Um, and I say that with, with a lot of confidence um, because very often in these cases, um, the young people um, spent a night or two in our detention facilities and were released, you know, within a, within a few days and very often right back home. Um, and so I think what we recognized was that, um, and, and as you can imagine, in some cases, there were further incidences, right? Because we just kind of plucked kids out for a minute, put them on pause and put them right back in without understanding what was happening um, within that household. And so what we have um, focused our attention now with our regional youth justice team in New York City is developing um, a pilot project um, that I think, is there an additional slide? Oh no, sorry, we won't jump. Um, that we're piloting in um, three of the um, communities that we um, saw um, a high level of um, these family conflict, family offense cases. We have a project in, um, in the hybrid section of the Bronx, we have a project in East New York in Brooklyn, and we have a project in Jamaica, Queens. Um, and basically what we are doing is linking up with existing neighborhood community coalitions who have traditionally been funded um, to, to work with families to prevent child welfare, um, formal child welfare system involvement. But these are folks who live and work within the neighborhoods who understand the families who have a trust and a bond with folks. And so we're really looking at develop, linking families up with the resources that they need to, to help to deal with, or in most cases, eliminate the stressors that are contributing you know, to the household. Um, we heard things, just for example, mom coming home from working long day and being upset because the kids had eaten up half the groceries, right? Because they're home all day. So now my grocery bill is higher. Now I'm more frustrated because what I was gonna cook for dinner is now gone, right? And so thinking about what can we do? We can link that family up with food pantries, with resources to support so mom doesn't need. And we can, you know, help the children, you know, recognize there's other things that they can be doing throughout the day, um, even though they're home. Um, and so, you know, a piece of it is the actual work in funding these community partnerships and working directly with families. We've created um, a new protocol in how we receive young people as they come into detention after hours and on weekends. And so that our intake staff um, identify them as family offense cases. There's an immediate referral. There's an outreach to that parent. There's a connection um, uh, uh, to the resource if the parent is interested. And we are seeing, um, we just started this October 1. We've had about 25 referrals so far, um, of which um, about 75% have been interested in, in, in receiving this type of support um, um, to kind of help them through the process. Um, and, and the beauty of this is they're not connected to formal system. I know a lot of folks would be like, well, these are kids in detention who are not released. Exactly. And they're not connected to formal system stakeholders that are connected to positive community resources that can work with the kid and the family uh, without that system um, stigma attached to them. Um, we're also recognized that that's a, that's a pretty small scale fix um, for right now that we need to think bigger about how does the 
you know, all of New York City um, look at and manage these types of offenses. And so, you know, we're we're partnering to um, coordinate um, some community forums um, first with our system stakeholders and then to a broader um, community. Really about are there things that we can be doing um, as formal system stakeholders um, to completely avoid either the con the call initially um, to NYPD. Or are there things that we can do to avoid um, a police drop off after hours to detention? Is there, you know, are there respite programs perhaps that yet exist or that should exist um, that could help to meet this need? And so this part of the process is working with these families, learning more about their specific needs, taking that information along with the, the energy and investment of existing stakeholders and developing a very specific um, plan for how New York City can move forward in addressing that issue. And that's pretty much all of um, what I have for you this morning. And the next slide is just my contact information. And I don't know, I think I'm right at about 30 minutes. I don't, which was the time I was allotted. I don't know if folks have questions or comments, but I'm open for whatever kinds of reactions you got. Everybody I, went to sleep, I, right? I, I no. want to uh, say I court uh, Courtney. This, oh, go ahead, Emily. Go ahead. Oh, I I I just think this is so fantastic, and I just want to. It's lovely to see you, Courtney, and. Um, I, I mean, this is the kind of work that we, you know, hope, it, it, we hope to see, we make grants, right? We don't know what the outcomes are going to be. Um, I just think you have taken this so seriously and empowered young people provided them with exactly what they needed during really, really difficult times. And, um, I, I, uh, I'm just really impressed and. It's it's great to see the level of engagement that you got in every aspect of this work, and you know, really look forward to continuing to, you know, hear about what you're up to. Thank you, thank you. I also really loved reading this report and um, seeing that the voices of the young people also match what we're seeing in the research about best practices. And that combination can really help us know how to direct our efforts. So I, this kind of qualitative research, it's just, it's great. I really loved it. Great job. Thank you. Thank you. I'm definitely going to share that back with the folks who, who really did the work. <laughs> Brittany, I, I just, I want to congratulate New York City. You know, I, I shared with Sarah how exciting um, this was and this is, and you know, also really excited about the next focus on the sort of domestic, um, how to get and keep those young people out of detention um, and really focusing on alternatives. And I just want to lift up, you know, respite um, is required in every um, county, PINS respite um, is, is required. And, you know, to really work closely, forge a relationship with DYCD um, or think about what what does respite and then family sort of um, uh, rep reparation work look like so that there's some cooling off period and people don't use detention as a place to help young people and, and families take a breather from each other. Um, and that you actually then can have a young person um, have a little bit more time and respite without it feeling like they're being punished for for something and have up to 21 days. So I just want to refresh, you know, remind folks that that's both a requirement and, a, and an option. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to jump in and kind of give Courtney some credit here because you had to deal with me a lot <laughs> because I had millions of questions. Um, and this was not easy uh, to get done, but I, you know, we kind of had the same vision and the goal of making sure that this was something um, that was meaningful and something that can be done through the use of the JAG fund. So I just want to give Courtney some kudos because she really took it um, and really made it happen in the face of the pandemic um, and really produced something really, really meaningful that I think has been adequately folded into the work that they do in New York City. And hopefully that other jurisdictions can take um, some lessons from. So I just kind of wanted to 
give that kudos to Courtney um, because this was a it was a long process, but we got here and and it's great. You know, I just wanted to say something because although I kind of introduced myself and said hello, you know, some folks here might not um, realize that I, I used to work at, at DCGS and I worked, um, you know, initially in, in OPDF and, and, and then focusing on, you know, the juvenile justice work and used to do DMC coordination. But I think the key to this project was not, you know, me or even the young people. It truly was the fact that, um, there was allowed the flexibility to shift gears um, mid project. And I say that, you know, because we were allowed um, to, to really look at, you know, a project that was initially targeting just girls. And we look at a system that was overwhelmingly male at a time um, when um, what's happening in the world was, it, it is really focused on social injustice. And so, you know, shifted our project to to really look at more race equity issues, and you'll you'll see that as you look at you know some of the writings um, of some of the young people and some of the things that they talked about, but also the flexibility of moving from in person to virtual, moving from spending you know money on one thing to really incentivizing you know uh, young people to participate to be able to support getting young people the tools they need to physically um, be able to participate. I think a lot of times jurisdictions um, look at, we wrote a grant, we wrote a proposal, oh my God, we're scratching our head. We have deliverables and reports that are due and how are we gonna meet those uh, means? I feel like, um, I know we in New York City are super grateful for the um, the option and the ability um, to really respond best to the young people's needs. You know, we could have done things very different. We might have turned back monies. I mean, one of the things that I'll say, you know, I've said to Shalane is, you know, we know we have problems as our as our regional youth justice team, which is our Jack, you know, continues to identify priorities. Um, you know, we want to make sure that we're conveying to, you know, to you all what those priorities are. We want to make sure that they're aligned with what some of the commitments that you, you know, that you're considering so that we can continue to work towards positive outcomes and not just fund programs, collect reports, report to the feds, right? We want to make sure, like, as I said earlier, that we're accountable to our constituents. And so, you know, I'm really, really appreciative, you know, both for the opportunity to receive the funding, to, to put some money in the hands of the young people, but for you also to listen to what they're saying and, and ideally um, put that back into, um, you know, your further work. So thank you very much for letting me join you guys today. Courtney, I feel and I wanna, that, um, I, this is I, Alan Riley. The report was very good. Excellent. I'm really glad you jumped on the uh, concern of safety because I think that's a really big thing with the youth today that um, they don't feel safe. So therefore, they're always looking over their backs and not getting things um, using the system the way it should be used. So I really appreciate you throwing that in there. Yeah, and, and I'm just gonna keep saying it. It's in there because the kids said it. it... <laughs> You know, so I want to concur with Alan's point. And, you know, first, I want to say, Courtney, it's really good to see you. Uh, I, I remember you're one of the few folks I remember having a dialogue when I first joined the JAG over 10 years ago. So it's good to see you and that that same energy and fire. I, I love that you, you know, um, how it's conveying, you know, in, in terms of showing up in this work. And I want to, you know, really lift up sort of Alan's point that I was, I was going in the same place in terms of how the kids are highlighting the significance of them seeking safety, not just physical safety, but there's also elements of emotional safety that they're describing as well as cultural safety that they're articulating. And, you know, as we think about, and I know we're gonna talk a little bit soon um, around our strategic plan and our action work is, you know, how do we lift up sort of this sentiment around safety and thinking about the coordination of our systems that embody sort of these sentiments of physical, emotional and cultural safety as an ongoing thread of, of the framing of work, right? Um, and, and in some ways, um, what's, uh, what's uh, uh, slightly emerging in some of the research work around trauma-informed care is a recognition that, you know, um, that, uh, that there's sentiments around sort of emotional and cultural safety as, uh, as, as elements of sort of what is also sort of described as part of the trauma. So, I'm glad that you all have lifted this up within this report. It's really going to serve us really well as a JAG. Great. Thank 
okay, I guess that's it. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much for uh, giving us these updates uh, for in terms of the New York City Regional Youth Justice Team. We're so excited. We can't wait to hear more about what is happening. All right, thank so uh, thank you. All right, so let's shift now to our um, new federal compliance monitoring requirements. Um, I'm not sure if this is Tom or Damon who's uh, kicking us off here. Tom's going to kick us off. Just just a brief overview, and just to kind of let us know that you know, let everybody know what's going on, and that we're working with our partners here with it. So, Tom, if you want to kick us off there. Yep, absolutely. Um, so, you know, we, we've been working with all of our partners uh, at SCOC, OCA, and OCFS to ensure compliance with new requirements that are becoming effective on December 21st. And, and these are requirements that um, were, were first enacted in the Juvenile Justice Reform Act in, in 2018. Um, so there are two main requirements. Um, first, there's uh, there are newly required interest of justice hearings that uh, that must be held before a juvenile who is charged as an adult can be detained in an adult jail or lockup while awaiting trial or other legal process. And secondly, there's clarifying language in the statute that uh, non-residential court holding facilities are included in the definition of jail or lockup for adults <clears throat> for the purposes of the jail removal requirement, which is focused on keeping youth out of adult jails and detention facilities. Um, Failure to comply uh, would result in, in penalties from our Title II funding. Um, but as we said, we're working closely with our partners um, and we're planning to update uh, OJJDP on where things stand in New York um, before the December 21st deadline. Um, so that's the basic overview and I'll, I'll just kind of open it up to our partners there at uh, SCOC, OCA, OCA and uh, OCFS to chime in if they, uh, would like to on this piece. So, hello, Tom. Uh, perhaps I should uh, go first and introduce some members of my team that we've invited to this meeting to uh, present our court system's position on these recent amendments and the upcoming requirement for a hearing uh, in these matters. Um, I have with uh, me today, uh, at this point of the meeting, Anthony Perry and Janet Fink, who are from our Office of Court Administration's Council's Office. And from my own office, the Office for Justice Initiatives, I have my Chief of Staff, Michelle Smith, and my uh, Director of Youth and Emerging Adult Justice, Thomas O'Neill. I believe that um, Jan and um, Anthony are prepared to address you. Yes, uh, thank you, Judge. Hi, my name is Anthony Perry. I'm a deputy counsel for criminal justice matters at OCA, uh, and it's been great uh, listening to all the good work that is being done uh, on this meeting. And I'm very happy to to at least present some of the uh, status and the concerns of OCA with respect uh, to uh, the, the newly uh, effective requirements of JGDPA uh, with respect to interest of justice hearings. Uh, that o OCA is you know, overall concern is that the, you know, the, the express policy purposes uh, that are behind both JJDPA, raise the age, uh, is an overall uh, acceptance that uh, youths should not be held uh, in uh, adult jail placements, uh, that youth should be held in age appropriate placements, uh, and that that should be the the goal that everyone is working towards, and we understand that everyone wants uh, to to reach that goal, and that the that OCA wants to be a good partner in ensuring that uh, adolescent offenders, youths that are being held uh, post arraignment, uh, especially in in criminal matters and in all matters, uh, will be placed in an appropriate setting. Uh, the the concern with the as we move forward with the interest of justice hearings, uh, isn't in actually being able to host the hearing. That OCA believes the unified court system will be fully capable of uh, handling interest of justice hearings, uh, especially for the the relatively limited number of, of youths that are currently uh, housed in a local adult jail facility. Uh, in th that those would be the most pressing group uh, of individuals that need to have such a hearing. Uh, prior to December 21st, uh, that the hearing would take the format of something along the lines of a securing order hearing as an application to have 
the court order uh, that the current placement is in the in the interest of justice. At, at the same time, OCA, uh, although you know, with the, the caveat that obviously uh, the Office of Court Administration cannot speak for any individual judge, uh, cannot uh, forecast or promise any specific outcome in a given case and that each judge uh, will, as a neutral magistrate, have to independently assess uh, the individual that is being detained, uh, their needs, their situation, and make an assessment of whether or not uh, the placement, uh, even under JJDPA standards of, of an interest of justice assessment, it's appropriate for them to continue in the adult, uh, the adult facility, uh, or uh, if it is not in the interest of justice uh, for that to take place, and uh, that there has been no overall change in circumstance regarding uh, the underlying and previously determined need to detain this uh, this youth, uh, that they then need to be returned uh, to an OCFS facility. That this then just brings to the fore what I know everyone here uh, wants to work to ensure that New York State has the capacity uh, to house all youths that should be in OCFS uh, facilities in those facilities and not have adult placements in local jails uh, to be a uh, an, an escape valve, an emergency valve for capacity issues. That the, the overall interest of justice assessment under JJDPA uh, does not have that as a factor for consideration. No one is alleging that anyone is stating that that is a factor for consideration under JJDPA. Uh, that a judge would consider at such a hearing, but that the spirit of that law and the spirit of raise the age uh, really weigh against um, such placements. And that, although obviously it not, not binding in any way, shape, or form on a court, we do then also note that there would be, uh, with respect to this category of individuals who are aged above 18 but below 21, prior to a resolution of their uh, case, so no sentence having been imposed, no plea or conviction after trial having been determined, that for that subset of individuals, the idea that they could be housed in an adult setting prior to having a disposition where they are uh, adjudicated or convicted of an offense uh, at, in such a, a less generous setting and less appropriate setting, but then once convicted and or adjudicated, they have to be returned to OCFS custody. We just want to highlight that that could raise uh, potential fundamental fairness and due process concerns with respect to whether or not such placements, even if they could possibly theoretically be found to be in the interest of justice under JJDPA, uh, whether or not they could uh, under state law be fully in compliance uh, with the, the due process rights and other considerations and the spirit of, of raise the age. Um, this is all just to really state that, <coughs> excuse me, that OCAs um, really would like to emphasize that the, the capacity issue <coughs> that is at the heart of a lot of the placements uh, that currently are taking, uh, that are currently uh, in effect for youths being housed in alternative uh, adult facilities, uh, that the underlying capacity issue is especially acute on Long Island uh, and in certain other uh, counties that do not have uh, the beds necessary uh, to provide the level of services, supervision, and specialized um, detention that these youths need and deserve should be at the, the forefront and at the, the top of everyone's uh, goals to make sure that uh, capacity is either shared where there is excess uh, around the state, but that for those areas that are perennially an issue um, since uh, raise the age coming into effect and JDPA now, uh, that these areas really need to be at the forefront of everyone's consideration, whether that's in the budget season, um, or elsewhere in the legislative session to ensure that there are um, not uh, interests other than the interest of justice for the individual youths that are uh, being detained while their cases work their way through the system uh, so that they can be detained in an appropriate OCFS facility uh, wherever it is uh, at all possible and in the interest of justice. 
so I also have my colleague Jan Fink uh, uh, on the line. I think that she would also like to 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 share some of her uh, reflections on this point. Jan, I'm trying. Okay, sorry about that. Um, I don't have a whole lot to add to what Anthony has said, except that this committee, I think, has a unique role in shaping the use of federal funding and uh, all in an attempt in part to assure compliance with federal law. And I think it's essential to note that the federal law um, obviously included the judicial hearing replacing an administrative process in order to reduce the number of jail placements. Um, the federal law, I should add, also requires that any jail that cares for a youth has to have trained staff who are trained in caring for youth. And this is something that we are fairly confident has not existed throughout the state um, and unfortunately does not exist in terms of the 20 or so youth who are currently in jails. Um, so the factors that the federal law includes are child related and crime related and related to the child's uh, history, not related to capacity. And so if there's anything that this committee can do to ensure that every county has the capacity it needs as a threshold issue so that any jail placements become really the rare exception and based on those federal criteria and not on any other criteria. Um, the budget season obviously will be critical. The language bills that accompany the budget obviously are a key means of, of shaping that. Um, and you know, I would note that um, in shaping these hearings, yes, we will hold them, but we need to be confident that all parties, the district attorneys who need to present these cases, the defense attorneys who need to defend them are all given all the information that is needed uh, sufficiently ahead of time so that they can prepare and hold um, effective hearings that relate to those child and crime related factors. Um, we know that, that um, OCFS has agreed to some of the suggestions that we made, but by no means all of them. And um, the, the information sufficiently in advance for preparation is a critical, critical aspect of it. Um, so I will leave it there um, just to add one thing, and that is on court holding areas. Um, for many years, we have worked with um, BCJS and, and SCOC on the issue of court holding areas for juveniles. Um, but prior to these amendments, they involve family court holding areas and ensuring that there is no, um, so, that there is sight and sound separation. Um, we understand that this now will extend to um, holding areas where youth in the youth parts are held. Um, so that, that's a significant expansion. Um, and we are looking forward to working again with DCJS and SCOC on those issues. Um, so we will entertain any questions. And Judge Mendelson, I don't know if you have anything to add. No, I, I don't have anything to add other than, you know, just the the uh, affirming that we as a, a court will be prepared to hold these hearings um, and, you know, putting an exclamation point on Jan's point that the those attorneys who may not be as well versed in this law and requirements really need to immediately, particularly for those 20 impacted uh, youth, the attorneys and the prosecutors need to be notified immediately. Judge, it's uh, Michelle. I just wanted to add that in our conversations with OCFS, we have uh, discussed exploring uh, New York City as a possibility to uh, address some capacity issues. 
And we know that uh, OCFS has made some preliminary, had some preliminary discussions, but we know that there is um, physical capacity and trained staff in New York City, um, but we don't know where we are in terms of being able to make any arrangements, particularly for the Long Island youth who are, you know, in adult jail. So I just wanted to raise that. Judge Mendelson, thank you and, and your staff um, who did, I think, just a, a fantastic job in laying out, um, you know, the framework for this challenge that we have in front of us as we sit here on December 7th, you know, 2021. And just, I, th I think it is important for um, the JJAG writ large, you know, to have a, a bit more additional context um, just out, outside of the law, right? So, you know, when we finally implemented the second phase of raise the age right before, unfortunately, COVID hit, you know, we were all celebrating, um, you know, the fact that right by and large, the law as it was being implemented was very successful. We saw, you know, um, amazing um, decreases, you know, far beyond what we ever expected to see in the arrests of young people. We had sufficient capacity, some detention facilities at that time had planned, you know, to expand, um, you know, for more additional specialized secure detention. And then, you know, COVID hit and, and a lot of things happened during COVID and subsequent to COVID that have had some rather seismic impacts on our entire system, detention being one part of it. And so, um, you know, I think it's important to to um, to lift up that um, you know that when we initially raised the age, there were no young people um, under the age of eighteen in any of our jails. There weren't, but for a confluence of of um, real life issues, right? That COVID and the severe workforce challenges that are rampant across virtually every human services sector and locally administered detention, you know, is no different. You know, the supply chain impacting detention capital investments um, is another reality. Um, you know, many young people, um, especially those with the most serious charges awaiting criminal trials have been spending very, very long periods of time in detention, which then holds beds that other, right? It's sort of this whole sort of confluence of a whole bunch of variables that have brought us here um, to this to this particular um, time. But I, I want to, um, you know, publicly uh, state to the JJAG and certainly to our, our um, partners that no one wants to see a young person in jail. No one wants to see a young person in jail. And those young people are in jail today because there was no other safe available place for them. And that rest assured, and, and I want to, you know, um, acknowledge Nina, um, just the Herculean efforts she and her team and all of us are doing at OCFS to try and move places and kids so that we can safely get these kids out of jail and back into detention. But if it were all that easy, we wouldn't have had these kids right needing to go into jail temporarily. So nothing is, you know, and this law has been around for a long time, right? We probably wouldn't even be having this conversation in 2019, nor ever imagining we'd be having the one, right, that we're trying to all solved together now. So I, I just wanted to make sure all of our JJ colleagues know that we at OCFS understand what's on the table here, right? A federal penalty, um, you know, that could impact um, certainly, you know, DCJS and all the amazing things that we have a JJAG has done and that we're working very, very hard, but we need partners to be working with us as we continue to um, to work together in solving this. So thank you. Thank you so much for uh, this contextualization around these uh, compliance monitoring requirements. I think as, as Sheila says, it's 
it's a complex issue and both uh, Jeff Mendelson and your team and you know the 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 need for us to be methodical in terms of really thinking about sort of what's possible and I concur with Sheila's point partnership is so key and um, I look forward to when we start talking about strategic action plan where the how do we carry that partnership element um, in helping to um, address some of the set of issues that are tied here uh, questions uh, thoughts folks have Right. Well, again, thank you so much for that presentation, um, Judge Mendelson and your team. Uh, so now we're going to move to um, a, a big chunk of our sort of work time today, which is around the strategic action plan. Um, I, I really see such close connection to all of the presentations we've had thus far. Um, in some ways, almost a bit of a, 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 a nice feeding to the strategic action plan, right? This This plan that we've we expended a great deal of energy during quarantine to build up, to approve, um, and we are at this precipice of needing to, we gotta move it forward. Um, and uh, particularly needing to move it forward because we're already well into year one of our strategic action plan. And it, so it is not lost on me, the need for us to really sort of, uh, you know, I, I was telling Tom and Damon that we, um, I feel as if we've been in neutral for a little while with this action plan. And we need to not only put it in drive, but you know we need to accelerate even further in terms of moving this action plan forward. So we're gonna um, we're gonna sort of take our time here this this for the rest of our time to really do some uh, some a bit of think out loud with each other because we need to we did some great work in terms of getting everyone to participate in the survey to give us a clear sense of what are some of the set of priorities that we want to. Um, established in terms of the action plan. We had, uh, if I remember correctly, 12 different areas. And we said, what are what are priorities for year one, year two, and year three? And um, and I know that uh, uh, Damon and Tom's team folks have been working on putting together a set of visuals to kind of help us organize. Well, what are we already working on? Um, where are strategic areas that we may, we may need to think as a JAG to accelerate even further? And what are some of the additional um, uh, ideas that we have as members to all also the working group, the grants working group, um, because the grants working group can can't work unless the uh, unless we as the JAG we give sort of the a clear direction of uh, what are going to be strategic areas of putting together for grant funding. So with that, turn it over to Tom. I think are you kicking us off, Tom? I think Damon's going to kick us off and then he's going to turn it over to me. Yep, I uh, definitely want to kick it off and say good afternoon to everybody. And, um, you know, thank you for all the presentations. And I think this kind of, Eddie, I agree with you, this kind of fits right in um, to what, what we're doing and what we're looking at doing. So, um, as you guys know, the Office of Youth Justice has been seen kind of as the um, uh, staff support for the JAG, but also, you know, especially as I'm hearing Courtney talk, you know, we're really looking at it as the operational um, support for the JAG, right? Like, how do we operationalize the strategic plan um, to get it to to get the money uh, from the JAG after they approve the plans to actually to the agencies on the ground so we can actually see the work so we can come back and hear more reports from, you know, places that have done some of this great work and made our strategic action plan work. So just to give you guys an overview of our office so that you guys can see some of the expertise of, you know, who's in the office, who we're working with and, you know, how, and how we're planning to operationalize it. I know Tom's going to give a little bit of background and talk about the survey and then Trista who's, um, you know, in charge of our, our program and for our office is gonna kind of talk to you guys about like how they've looked at the strategic plan, you know, kind of looked at themes, programming, and really kind of get into the nitty gritty and really hopefully, um, you know, spark a pretty good discussion about it. So our office, um, as you can see, is I'm the deputy commissioner here. Um, Trista is, is the chief of criminal justice program and, and planning development and, you know, working with Trista, our Meg and Shalane, you know, really bringing this programming piece to life. Uh, Tom, is our chief of policy and implementation, and he he's helping us. You know, he's doing a lot of the back end administrative things, looking at budgets. You know, how the money's going out, and so that we can keep track of what's what's going out, what's getting spent. Um, Tom, if you go to the next slide, real quick, um, because I I don't need a big part in it, because really the part should be from you guys, the work you guys are doing, and so you guys can kind of see with the mission 
um, of our offices, you know, making sure that we provide resources and expertise to promote positive change and improve the quality of responsiveness for the juvenile justice system um, on behalf, which is the big piece, right, of youth and family. So you see where some of Tom's expertise are, some of the stuff that he's done, uh, same with Trista, uh, Megan and Shalane there. And, and then we have also have Taffney Wallace, who's, you know, supports us on the back end as the program aid. And really what we want, want you guys to see is that, you know, there, there's a group of experts that have been doing this work for quite some time and really have expertise in certain areas and also have partnerships across the board where we're working with, you know, the, the YJI, where we're working with OCFS, where we're working with OCA, and we're working with a lot of external partners to help, you know, bring some of this strategic plan to life here. So with that, I'm going to kind of turn it over to you, Tom, and let you let you talk about the background and some of the other things that we're doing. Okay, great. Thanks, Damon. Um, so I know we have uh, obviously some new members here today and, and just to give a, a brief background, um, the JAG engaged in a strategic planning process in 2020 and approved uh, the new three-year strategic action plan in June. Um, included in that plan is an overarching vision, three main goals, and 12 specific action items. Um, you can find that plan publicly available on the DCJS website under uh, reports and publications. Um, and as uh, Eddie had mentioned earlier, uh, in October, the Youth Justice Institute surveyed JAG members about prioritizing the action items that are in the plan. Uh, we did include a summary of uh, the results in your packet, uh, which I'll go through quickly before we get into a conversation on the programming side. So I will um, see if I can share that screen quickly. Oops. Okay, so um, here's what we uh, got from the survey back in October. Um, we asked folks to rank the, um, the items in the plan. Uh, 13 of 16 members of the then 16 members completed the survey, and uh, here's a summary of the results. Uh, they were looking for the immediate focus to be on addressing racial and ethnic disparities, focus on trauma healing behavioral health, procedural justice at all system points and establishing police and community partnerships. Um, then for year two, align efforts and services, youth, family, and community partnerships, deliver prevention services, uh, prevention efforts and youth centered services and train and certify youth serving professionals. And then in year three, support implementation science, tra translational efforts and effective outcomes, partner with schools, sustain positive outcomes from pandemic related changes and youth centered service delivery. Um, quickly, I'll just go through some of the, the comments uh, to help kind of spur the conversation as, as we get going on this. Um, here they are. Uh, it'll be more than enough work. There is a lot of stuff in the plan. There's a lot of overlap in the plan. And I think you'll hear Trista kind of talking about how the program staff uh, are suggesting that we organize some of these things. Um, addressing racial disparities should be integrated into all aspects of the work. Um, pandemic related forms more than just virtual service delivery. Um, uh, there's natural crossover, uh, micro targeted interventions um, are, are a part of this here. Um, plan prioritization should lead with a uh, natural flow of priorities uh, to ensure implementation, but sustainability into the future as well. Um, racial and ethnic disparities should always be a top priority and, uh, and, and we should really be training staff to address the immediate needs of our youth. Um, some comments on specific funding ideas are, you know, to complement some of the JAG funding pursue Ford Foundation funding, My Brother's Keeper funding, um, build effective community partnerships at the local level to decrease costs, um, and uh, 
any, anything that uh, we put the money into should guarantee positive outcomes and ensure that the uh, work is sustainable. So I just wanted to kind of brush upon those things uh, quickly before we move on to uh, getting really into the programmatic conversation that uh, Trista is going to lead us in. And I will pull up uh, her document for her as we go through that. Thanks, Tom. Good afternoon, everyone. And this is really sort. This is um, not just my document. This is a team document. Um, as Damon um, mentioned briefly, the program team is comprised of myself, Shalane, and Meg within the Office of Youth Justice. Um, and what you're looking at is a visual representation of our interpretation of the JAG strategic plan and the results of the prior the prioritization survey that you all completed. And so when we looked at the two things together, we really um, saw things in themes and major buckets of programming of which all of those themes would be those themes would be woven throughout um, any sort of implementation of programming. And so the, the first um, sort of theme, the first sort of top bucket of things it, are the themes that we really saw, which were data, such as implementation science, translational efforts, which is a qualitative piece. We heard how important that was earlier with Courtney's presentation and on how that really can help um, drive um, what we're doing and who's better off and getting us information about that. Um, and then looking at um, data as it relates to effective outcomes. Um, youth, family, and community voice. The plan is drenched in that, right? Like youth, family, and community voice, even partnership, right? Beyond voice, just partnership um, in itself is a very central part of your team, of your, of your strategic plan, whether that's through youth-centered service delivery or incorporating youth and family and community within the context of any sort of programming or work that's going on. Alignment, alignment, alignment. We hear alignment everywhere across the board. And as we're looking at your plan and as we've heard you all um, speak and we looked at the results of your survey, really alignment um, not only with the JAG and other bodies such as the regional youth justice teams, the partnership for youth justice, um, the Youth Justice Institute and our work with the schools, but also alignment within um, our partner agencies while we're implementing programming. So how is that across the board? I think Courtney even highlighted from the young people, right? You want us to do all these things and the systems aren't talking to each other. And we've done, a, we've worked really hard over the last few years intentionally um, within the context of the partnership and our other work to get better at alignment, but that's always something that we need to work on. And then Pandemic related successes. So what are things, you know, we did have a huge drop in detention. We understand things are shifting and that looks a little bit differently, but what other things related using um, technology through schools, mental health, the course, anything related to successes through the pandemic um, that we can look at implementing and infusing through programming. So that's really sort of what we saw within the, the themes of what you all were looking and hoping to implement. And at the end, I'm gonna to pause to make sure and say, hey, did we get this right? Or are we way off base here? Um, but then when we looked at sort of programming, what the buckets of programming would look like, um, we really saw police and community partners. Um, and, you, and, and you'll see, you know, we've identified sort of what years that you all had suggested you wanna look, look at these things. Um, and then we have equity. Um, and a big bucket of equity, which has a bunch of other things underneath there, such as rural, um, obviously racial and ethnic disparities, when we're talking about um, equity, but also things around um, gender, sexual and gender identity, girls justice and rural community work, um, trauma, healing and behavioral health, and then prevention as sort of the four buckets of programming. Um, and I wanted to um, give my team a chance to sort of talk about some of the things that we either are currently funding or, I, or or some things that could be thrown on the list of things to look further into um, within the areas that are their sort of subject matter expertise. Um, and then from there, we can, you know, move into questions if that's okay with folks. And I can only see the screen in Eddie. So <laughs> Eddie, you're shaking your head. thumbs up. Okay, great. So um, Meg. Thanks, Trista. Mm -hmm. So I'll kick off our first um, focus area, which is the police and community partners. Um, we saw a lot of support for this program um, area in question one and two of the JAG survey. A lot of 
the responses overwhelmingly favored this. Um, so it became our first bucket for year one. Um, it's also well supported in um, the major themes of the JAC strategic plan, obviously, and goals two and three um, in particular. So some of the work that we are doing um, related to police and community partners um, includes the OPS, the Office of Public Safety here at DCJS, Trust Building and Reconciliation Framework. Um, so this is a fairly new project um, that came to be as a result um, of um, what happened with Floyd, um, George Floyd um, in that incident. Um, it got DCJS folks talking, it got OP, um, particularly OPS and SNUG and other community members talking about you know, what that incident meant to them um, and how things could change um, because of what happened. So it's based on the reconciliation framework, um, which is um, supported by the National Network for Safe Communities at John Jay College and really um, looks at um, some of the opportunities um, to reckon past harms and to talk about them, to expose them, to deal with them, um, to learn how they continue to be in the present and how to take action to repair and reform those past harms. Um, it's a way for people who are not normally engaged in these conversations um, to help reshape them. So um, that's something um, that is an, a newer um, project, but a longstanding strong partnership for our office with the Office of Public Safety. Um, Trissa and I co-wrote um, a delinquency prevention um, grant um, two years ago, and we were awarded money um, like the Title II. Um, it's just a separate federal funding stream that we got um, in for FY20. And that included um, money for funding for um, more trust building and reconciliation work. Um, so we're very excited um, to receive that funding and to be able to continue um, this project. Um, the Another project that has um, been um, very well supported and well received is the SNUG program, which now um, you guys heard in our last drag meeting that they're part of our office. So we have um, some access and an opportunity to really learn and dig in um, from those program experts and the work that they're doing and how we can support them and how they can support us and how we can support the young people in the communities across New York State. Um, the other program area that we were, are currently working on is the alternatives to arrest framework, which was also part of um, a DPP award. Um, Trista and I co-wrote um, for a second consecutive year, the FY21 award and won that also. Um, two completely separate program focuses for those um, DPP awards, but um, aligns very strongly with the work that the JAG would like to see um, happen. So we're hoping to offer um, in three pilot jurisdictions, uh, we're hoping to offer um, an alternative to arrest um, option, um, particularly for runaway and homeless youth, um, so that we can begin to see the impact. We haven't been able to find a lot of data and support on it yet here in New York State. So we're hoping um, to be able to work with uh, local law enforcement agencies and grassroots organizations on how we can build that project out. So that's a new project for our office, but something we're um, very excited about. Um, coming in January or February, um, sometime early winter, is a youth and police engagement presentation with our office and the Office of Public Safety. We are teaming up with Albany Police Department to um, present to between 200 and 300 patrol level officers, um, investigators, and other law enforcement officials um, across New York State for about an hour and share some of the work that we've been doing here locally. So that's uh, two. Uh, to becoming a project. Um, and then the credible messenger um, work we've been, you know, um, working through for a while now, we're just trying to figure out, you know, where it makes sense um, and how to do it the right way. And then finally, the runaway and homeless youth, which I talked about as part of the DPP award. It's a newer area of focus for us. Uh, we've been in contact with OCFS on how we can collaborate and partner on some of the program pieces of that, but um, that was, um, that came to be as a result of an award that uh, we wrote outside of the Title II funding. So between those projects, and th this is not an exhaustive list, but those are some of the bigger um, projects that we're working on. Uh, um, we're hoping to be able to really strengthen and build that community and police partnership. And then I think, um, Tristel? Yeah, thanks, Meg. Um, 
So again, aligned really with um, your priority areas and your strategic plan. Um, and we sort of advancing through other um, funding streams um, as we were waiting on delays with our Title II funding as we, as we worked through that. Um, uh, equity is is the next sort of program bucket. Um, and, and within equity, like I said earlier, we have um, not only talked about addressing racial and ethnic disparities, which is a huge component of your plan, right? We saw it in the survey results. We see it in your plan. Um, you know, is specific programming around that. So the Policy Equity Academy, um, which you all have heavily invested in. We also got some external grant funding through the um, Annie Casey Foundation to help support it. Um, as again, as we had some other funding delays um, and our partners at the Youth Justice Institute. So again, alignment and partnering with um, the folks that uh, advance youth justice work. Um, and so that is an example of what we're funding under the um, racial and ethnic disparities. We have rural communities. We're throwing that under equity because we're expanding the definition of equity um, for our particularly rural jurisdictions who may have different issues. So we have the Rural Communities of Practice Initiative, which is, again, something that JAG has funded um, um, and supported. And I know that OJJDP has highlighted the work and the efforts of that um, with your all support. Um, we have um, also looked at SOGI, um, which uh, again is we're throwing under the bucket of equity, so sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression. We uh, have done some technical support and training and data collection, again, not with funding from the JAG, but supportive of that. And the JAG has supported um, Georgetown teams to attend their program. Um, Proceed um, and some additional. We've also supported and partnered with MBK um, and their initiative at the state ed, state ed's initiative around MBK and really thinking about sort of how we continue to move that forward. Some other potential ideas that we've talked about but that haven't been funded um, are freedom schools. Um, uh, Chancellor Young, I know that that is something that we have talked about, um, and then also um, procedural justice. So procedural justice was was a big um, thing that came up in your plan, and as we were looking at procedural justice, we really thought, and again, our interpretation of what you all were saying, and you could say, hey, we're wrong, was that this was about equity, right? Procedural justice about equity, fairness, transparency, and so um, you know, while while we think that there components of procedural justice and a lot of programming, and we can look forward to um, diving deeper into that. Um, and then I'm just going to ask Shalene to round us out on our last um, two program bucket areas, and then we'll open the floor for questions, comments, and other direction. Shalene? Great. Thanks, Trista. Um, so I want to quickly walk through trauma healing and behavioral health, which is one of the themes that was present specifically um, in in the survey and also in looking at training and certifying youth professionals um, that's present in goal number two. And so when we look at trauma healing and behavioral health, we, we house girls justice under there because there's a large consideration for in dealing with girls, the trauma that they have. And we know that girls, especially girls of color, experience the system very differently than their white counterparts. And so some of the things that we've done within the, uh, within the Office of Youth Justice is working on a second chance grant that introduced a trauma screen, which was done in a pilot effort across a few counties. Um, within the state through um, probation. So our Office of Probation and Correctional Alternatives. They're gearing up to do a second pilot through a couple of counties. Um, so our office has been involved with that as well. One of the other things that just launched this week was this collaboration that we did with CCSI um, and, and OMH in creating a trauma curriculum that was a train the trainer model um, for youth serving professionals um, to train their organizations and their respective uh, community agencies on trauma-informed care. Um, so that the first pilot program of that did occur this week, the first two sessions did. Um, one of the other things that we have been focused on and has been an initiative that I was given the grace to kind of take forward and run with is this understanding of healing centered engagement. So we talk a lot about trauma-informed care, but there's more to that and how do we move past just being trauma informed with the understanding that there's a measure of healing um, that needs to occur in our communities in order to foster success within the youth that we're seeing in our communities and so a lot of what we do what we're talking about with healing centered engagement really is aligned pretty well um, with the desire to be 
um, to have a system that is equitable um, and to create positive relationships, even when we're talking about police and community um, and the work that we're doing uh, with SNUG and alternatives to arrest. Um, credible messenger, again, is something that we have been taking a look at and understanding what exactly it is and how do we fold that into the work that we do. Um, handle with care is something I know that OCFS um, has done and we have had some interest from regional youth justice teams in understanding how they can fold handle with care into uh, their work. And for those that don't understand or, or know what handle with care is, essentially it is if, for example, if a youth, let's say, has been in a domestic uh, dispute that occurred at home, you know, handle with care is a good partnership between the police, the schools, um, and, and allowing the school to, the police to communicate to the school, like, listen, this young person was involved and they may not show up at school and as their best self. So we need to literally handle them with care. So if they tend to, you know, drift off to sleep, you know, it may be because they were late because the they were up late because the police were at their house. And so please handle them with care. And instead of sending them out and to be in trouble or suspending them for sleeping in class, maybe send them to the nurse's office so that they can get a wink of sleep so that they can come back and re-engage. Um, and another effort that we've done in the, realm of, in the realm of trauma and addressing trauma is the Trauma Champions Collaborative. Um, this was a statewide collaborative that we um, had worked to build over the course of the past couple of years now, um, in which we really are, are building it as a resource for youth serving agencies to really have a presence on the New York State Trauma Informed Network as we build resources and also promote having a shared language and understanding what trauma is, what trauma, what it means to be trauma informed as a state agency, and also um, doing the work to understand the intersectionality between trauma and race and ethnicity. So those are some of the things that we have already done within OYJ and that we are looking to expand. Um, and again, as, as mentioned before, these are not exhausted lists. These are just ideas and strategies just to show you all that many of the things that you all have been that were lifted in the survey and in the goals of the strategic plan are things that we um, have been doing within the Office of Youth Justice. Um, so I want to quickly move into prevention. And so that's to deliver prevention efforts and youth centered services. One of the things that we realized in looking at the strategic plan is really that prevention was an area that we have not done a lot of work in and there's vast room um, to really beef up this area for us um, through your strategic plan. And so again, you'll see some of the reoccurring themes about programmatic strategies and ideas of credible messenger, uh, beefing up the, the um, partnership, excuse me, with MBK, looking at the freedom schools, mentoring and after school programs, which is something that is stipulated in our Title II funding um, that we need to really look a little closer at and again doing more partnership uh, work with OCFS especially in the realm of runaway and homeless youth so with that said I'll turn it back over to Trista. Thanks Shalane. <clears throat> um, so really um, like we just wanted to share this is sort of how we took the strategic plan um, and your survey results and sort of what we hope we captured the intent of what you all were looking to um, do um, and looking at themes that could be woven into not only current programming, but future programming and any programming ideas or programming options as it, as it relates to the buckets um, that you have outlined in your plan. And so um, basically, Eddie, um, just, I guess, turn it back to you um, to, for every, anyone on the JAG to provide sort of comments, feedback, um, you know, is, did we capture your intent? Is there some, you know, is there things missing? You know, you know, other sort of open discussion. I mean, Thank I you so much. I'm just going to come back later, right? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Trista um, and Megan and uh, and Shalene for that overview. Uh, just a, uh, you know, uh, just a couple of points. Um, and and I want to, uh, for us as a JAG to kind of start first with some clarifying you know, questions or thoughts that we may have, um, you know, so a couple of things I wanted to state was one, um, just so, you know, and this may be my own sort of clarifying sort of point and or question is when we look at this document, the theme that you all are highlighting there, you're lifting up from our strategic plan uh, showcases the, uh, what I see is that, you know, these are, 
the themes are important elements that need to live across all of the set of programmatic and uh, programmatic focus areas, right? So, okay, I just wanted to sort of uh, to understand to get your 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 you also thought as it's seeing this sort of this document. Um, and then second clarifying point was what you all are providing here is um, not a finite list, but almost like a springboard for us to work from as a JAG in terms of, well, what's the stuff that's already active that as a JAG we have, we are currently or may historically have um, been aligned with and providing supports that um, fit right along where as a JAG we can use as a springboard for um, uh, to get our brainstorming going around some uh, areas of potential funding. So I just wanted to, as a clarifying question or thought that I wanted to make sure I put out there and then opening it up for other JAG members for, for their own clarifying questions or thoughts. Yes, Eddie, that's correct to both of those. So the themes are things that we see interwoven to all the buckets of programming, right, as, as we're as we're looking at sort of what programming is going to look like. Um, and then this is not an exhaustive list, right? It doesn't, you know, the, there's, it doesn't include things that may have recently finished. Um, we haven't fully fleshed out everything that all of the RYJTs are doing um, within the context of this work. And again, we've pulled in other funding areas, um, other funding streams that we have received and are currently working on. Um, just to show you how it connects to the strategic plan and the work that the JAG is doing um, and how we are constantly moving to try and advance not only your plan, the strategic plan, but also the other elements of Title II. There's like 33 program elements and priority areas that, is list that are listed within the um, JJDPA itself and then other areas as well. So yes, not an exo not exhaustive list by any means. Um, and some of them are just some quick ideas we had um, you know, obviously, if there's any programming that either the JAG specifically wants um, us to look at, we're happy to go back and do the research and bring proposals forward um, or other ideas that we might come up to the grants working group or however that process will move going forward. Um, those are all, all things for consideration. Wonderful. This is like, again, just to point out, this is like our brain on paper, like a visual representation of our brain. We're in a conference room with sticky flip chart paper on the wall, um, and then Meg made it look pretty. Like, I'm just being fully transparent about that. Like, this is sort of our thinking of what we're seeing um, based upon your plan and your survey results. Eddie, I have a question. Yes, go ahead, Joe. Yeah. Uh, the first one is this is extremely helpful. Thank you very much, Trista and everyone for putting it together. The, this is, I think, just exactly something that we need. And um, what it does for me is it highlights the importance of the next step, which is we know what our priorities are and we had wonderful meetings and produced a report. And what you've laid out here is, okay, now we're already doing all of this. And so then to me, it raises the question of, okay, so what are the gaps? And what else needs to be done in order, given the fact that you're doing all, we're already doing all of this, what else remains that we really should take steps on? And the one comment I want to make in relationship to that also is, and, and when you're going through the uh, themes, which I think are very, very helpful, it's got to cut across ideas, regardless of what the topic is. Um, you mentioned underneath the alignments that you did not put in or also should be included in there was the other agencies. And I think part of it, as I start thinking through how helpful this is and where do we go, then I think somehow we need to overlay some of that so that I know on the police side, we talked about the need for additional police training. And on the trauma piece, we talked about the need to greater access to behavioral health. So to me, we almost need to finish all of this by pulling in at least the most relevant pieces from other agencies and then saying globally, then here's what we have is everything that's going on and where are the gaps so that we're making sure we're not duplicating things that are already out there. Thank you. Very, very helpful again. Thank you. Um, and if I could just add any, um, we put the partnership for you, the PYJ, which is the partnership for youth yep. justice. And I think that we've had some presentation, but that includes agencies like OMH, right. SED, 
um, local representatives from the regional youth justice teams, um, OCA, DCJS, OCFS, um, and I'm missing out some part, YJI, um, and I'm probably leaving out a, a few other partners, but that does include um, a lot of our other partner agencies, um, Developmental Disabilities Planning Council. So um, just for folks who aren't familiar with the Partnership for You Justice, I did just want to highlight that that does include a lot of um, our um, partners at other agencies. But thank you for highlighting that. I, I have a comment. Oh, sorry. This, this is Heather LaForm. Um, and, and just looking at this, I think there can be, you know, or maybe we should highlight, you know, the active work that we're doing with the tribal nations, right? Police and community partners. We have, I, I know two nations either have a law enforcement or their own uh, marshal services. Um, you know, what is the work that's being done with them, especially around the juvenile justice? Um, with the equity, right? Are again, are we working with the tribal communities? Um, trauma healing and behavior health is a big issue right now for the uh, tribal communities. Again, with the residential boarding schools and and the unearthing of the graves in Canada, um, and with the the uh, initial the federal boarding school initiative here in the United States, you know, we're gonna start seeing some uh, some of this trauma and this healing that's gonna happen within the communities. Um, and, and a lot of that leads to, you know, the American Indian, Native American population coming into contact with the juvenile justice system just because of all the historical trauma that has happened to the nations. Um, and then, and then the, the prevention piece too, like, what are we doing around that? What are we doing to ensure that our, our tribal youth aren't coming into contact? What are the prevention measures around that? Um, and again, so just, you know, you can put place something of, of, of tribal issue, right? right into each theme and uh, program focus areas on this form. Thank you so much for that, Heather. And it's reminding, you know, um, you know, uh, for me, I'm, I'm highlighting sort of the significance of how do, how does it live, you know, you know, I think you, you mentioned sort of some of the points that are currently active that may speak to um, uh, sort of trauma-informed care but I think there's touch points, I think also that fit in all these other areas. How are we uh, making sure that this work that we are proposing and looking at supporting work throughout the state is attentive to all elements of some, all the communities throughout New York State? Yeah, and I and just if I could add another comment, Eddie. So like the police and community partnerships, for example, and thank you for adding that, Heather, um, around the piece around our tribal communities and partners. Um, for example, the, the trust building is about police and community relations, but it's also about equity, considering the the amount of injustice amongst law enforcement between that has occurred in our communities of color and the issues with law enforcement and their relationships. So just wanting to highlight that some of even the programming can cross multiple sort of program areas. Um, within the context of what we're doing with certain components of, of programming. So I just also wanted to highlight that. It's Trista, and um, uh, this is Meredith. I, I appreciate you mentioning the PYJ. I know that we have a seat at the table there and you know these kind of conversations uh, you know, certainly come up. Um, I just wanna highlight that you know, at the Office of Mental Health, we have a myriad of initiatives that are going on that I think are um, opportunities for addressing some of these issues. You know, I hope everybody is aware, but you may not be, so I'm just going to say it, <laughs> that uh, the Office of Mental Health is embarking upon um, growing and strengthening a, um, a full continuum of care around crisis services, starting with uh, the development of um, a universal 988 um, crisis call number. Uh, statewide, uh, along with um, expanding mobile crisis services, the creation of crisis stabilization centers, uh, as well as crisis residents for those that need uh, um, longer than 23 hours of, of, of service support, and um, 
and some additional um, uh, crisis efforts. I say this because one of the things that obviously is coming up quite significantly in the conversations that we've been having um, with our partners, I think actually even DCGS is at the table if, <laughs> um, in this conversation is the issues of um, uh, crisis response by police and how we would really want to work collaboratively with um, police departments um, to partner um, with them and send individuals out with them in response to mental health crises to make sure that um, the individuals are being diverted to appropriate clinical care environments like crisis stabilization uh, as opposed to other uh, in, um, criminal oriented environments. So um, uh, the issues of obviously also diversity and equity come up in our conversations in regards to that. So I just wanted to highlight um, those efforts that are ongoing at the Office of Mental Health. In addition, on the children's side, um, you know, barring the, the the significant challenges that we're having uh, in the mental health system, and I'm sure also in uh, uh, all systems across the country um, in regards to staffing and workforce. Um, so it's really impeding our capacity for access. But as a result of the pandemic, um, there's obviously been uh, an expansion and exacerbation of mental health needs. Um, so we're really working to obviously grow and expand and service access. But in, in regards to that, we're also trying to um, take an opportunity to use federal fundings to support initiatives that we know will be beneficial to the children with significant needs. And we are revisiting, Tom, uh, our capacity to grow and reimburse for evidence-based practices um, under the children's service system. So we are um, really looking now at really integrating and creating capacity for the, uh, the reimbursement of services such as FFT, and MST, which we know works with very well with um, children who are multi-system involved, including juvenile justice. So we're very excited to be able to do that. We know ACS has done that ex um, extensively in New York City, but we're really hoping that this provides an opportunity to grow those services um, throughout the state and bring services to bear that are really successful um, for multi-service kids uh, throughout the state. So those are just a couple of things, but I just thought I'd mention them because I think they're really commensurate and, and uh, complementary to some of the things that have been discussed in these lists, which are great, and we're looking forward to continued partnership and involvement with you both here and at the PYJ. Go ahead, Brendan. So, Brendan. so, so first of all, great work all around, Trista. This is awesome from you and your team. This, this definitely hits uh, hits where we're talking about. Um, I think it would be interesting down the road at some point to kind of map out across the state, like where we're at, like who's who's been able to implement um, a lot of these different pieces, like where we're at, and that might give us as uh, as the JJAG like uh, like better like informed. And I know, like I think we've talked about this, but I think it would give us maybe some better informed like uh, um, knowledge to be able to say like, okay, where do we want to try to influence? Like if we're doing. We're doing part of this in Albany, but we're not doing it in Syracuse, and I'm just using those examples. Um, then, like, okay, let's try to influence Syracuse to pick that up, or or just vice versa. We're not doing a piece in Albany where we think like we need to get that. Maybe that's where we start to get our influences, or you know, hey, we have that conversation with Tristan and her team to say, hey, if the handle with care is not implemented in a certain part of the state, but we recognize how much that would help with trauma informed care with kids in school, like how do we how do we help influence that to get that? Um, statewide. I mean, I remember when that that got taken uh, that got implemented in Albany. It was like a really good point point to get that input into the schools and the police department to get that that uh, off the ground. So, you know, maybe at some point we can kind of have like almost a, a mapping exercise where we're able to see like where we have the various initiatives off the ground and then where where we want to go from there to to try to influence and get and get get the others uh, on board. But again, great, great work. This is awesome. I also want to highlight, you know, folks want to share in the chat as well. Any reactions or thoughts? I, I'm, I have a running document where I'm literally typing what everybody's saying and copying and pasting from the chat. <laughs> so please feel free to, feel free to jump, dump in there as well. I, I, is it okay if I? Oh yeah, go ahead, Emily. 
Um, I guess I'm one of the people who like wrote in the comments about the racial and ethnic disparities issue. Like I have just been absolutely distraught for the over the last year of seeing, especially over the pandemic when the numbers were really down, just our, you know, continued issues around uh, racial disparities in our in our system. And, you know, I'm right now, yesterday I spent the day at a symposium at the Center for Children's Law and Policy here in DC uh, with the just, you know, it was like the all stars of juvenile justice here ever. And just, I mean, across the nation, this is a, you know, a, a problem that is just plaguing uh, just, you know, youth justice systems. Uh, and I, I just, I, I don't know, it's such a big, um, you know, it, 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 it overarches just absolutely everything that we, we do. And, um, I mean, I'd love to see us figure out how to be a national leader, like that the country is looking for leadership in this area. And I do think we have a lot of money coming in, hopefully, and we have opportunity to maybe really think very, very deeply about how we like, we can't just keep having these presentations with the numbers be the same. Something has got to change. And I know I really appreciate Sheila previously standing up sort of saying, you know, that similar things and others. And I mean, I don't have the answers, but um, I would love for us to really be very deeply focused in this area. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for saying that, you know, Emily, I think there is a, you know, one of the things that I struggle with is, you know, being a, as, we, as I look at the themes in particular. So, for example, um, how a theme like, for example, alignment, um, how does it you know, how does misalignment sort of play a role in some of that disparity exacerbation? Um, and, you know, so I appreciate your point because in some ways it's the, um, it's, it, it needs to be that and others being a through line that cuts across how we are, in some ways we use as a bit of a, a litmus test of what we are funding, right? Is it, is it moving us in the direction of of reducing the patterns of disparities. Hello, may I just say something, please? Yes, please, Judge Mendelson. I was looking for a raise a hand function that we have on Microsoft Teams that I couldn't find here. Um, I placed it in the chat that as um, many of you know, um, um, our court system has been engaged in the Equal Justice and Courts Initiative, which is our response to um, the killing of George Floyd, as well as some disturbing and racist um, social media depictions by court employees in recent times. And our Chief Judge DeFiori, uh, Janet DeFiori, has recently issued a year in review report that um, uh, my team and I worked on um, highlighting the various efforts that the courts are engaged in, in trying to promote racial uh, justice in our system. Um, I'm going to be passing along to Tom an, an email with all of, uh, with some, um, I believe, um, interesting documents for you to consider. Thank you. Uh, and I should mention that I am leading the Equal Justice Initiative on behalf of the state court system. Thank you. Um, I do also just want to highlight that New York State does have a racial and ethnic disparities advisory committee um, that you know, we say we meet quarterly. We meet more often than than that, um, unless I'm like out on maternity leave and then there's a little bit of a, a pause, but um, we um, also have identified a bunch of priority areas for our focus over the next few years, which align with some of the things that you all have identified. And I'm happy to share that with 
with anyone. Um, you probably got it when you got the application, um, our application, our Title II application submission, because it is in the RED three-year plan, um, but happy to share that as well. And also to recirculate the three-year plan as it relates to uh, racial and ethnic disparities and advancing equity. Um, just wanted to, to throw that out there and share that as equity is a major focus of the work of OIJ as well. And um, the PYJ has added an equity impact um, column to the work that we're doing um, as it relates to um, some reform policy program reform efforts. So just for folks to know, some of our next steps that is going to emerge is, um, you know, this this conversation, um, these salient points that you all are bringing up, the organization of what um, of what um, the DCJS team just presented to us um, is going to be used, brought together by the grants working group. Our next meeting is scheduled for January 12th. Um, and at that meeting, we're literally, we're going to look at year one and year two priorities and just go through the list and, um, and start articulating, you know, what are going to be, um, what are the opportunities for um, funding um, uh, a potential sort of uh, um, uh, putting together sort of uh, grant opportunities in relation to our priority areas that you all have outlined here. Uh, and, um, and we will bring you know, share that back with you all again as 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 a JAG. I want to make sure that we're constantly feeding you, feeding us as a JAG in terms of where um, what we are looking to support that is alignment with our strategic plan. Um, and so the the grants working group is, you know, I, I'll say this, and I hope uh, others on the grants working group are um, are are you know do uh, also excited about the fact that we've got. We've got some good stuff that you all are kind of laying out for us to um, to start putting together for you all as a JAG and that we can bring back and uh, particularly for our March meeting to um, to uh, to review uh, potential uh, grant proposals. Um, other other thoughts, any questions that folks may have around whether it's the next steps or just clarifying questions that uh, others may have regarding the um, uh, what Trista, uh, uh, Megan, and Shailene kind of has shared with us. I have a question. Um, being new, I'm kind of listening and I'm trying to take in everything that you have been doing. I see there's something here about um, access to technology in the pandemic, and I'm wondering if broadband is something you've talked about. I work as a, I've done a lot of telehealth over the pandemic, and we have a lot of rural communities um, up up where I live and. They just don't have access to that kind of technology. Is that something that you've talked about in your planning to be able to get services to people in these rural communities? Uh, not specifically in terms of um, that element in that I I recall in any of our recent meetings, in particular, given I think over the last year and a half. But Tom Damon. Well, uh, Megan has done a lot of work on rural communities of practice, um, you know, and there have been some grants that have uh, gone out across the state on rural communities of practice. Um, I'm not sure, Megan, if there's been anything specific on broadband, but um, but I'll, I'll just turn it over to her to to kind of comment on that. Thanks, Tom. Um, so, yes, I mean, it, it has come up in um, some of our. Um, conversations with the rural communities in New York State. We have an initiative that started back in 2016. Um, the JAG has um, had a couple of presentations on phase one and two so far, and we have officially kicked off phase three. Um, there's an RFP live now. Um, so, but what's cool about the Rural Communities of Practice initiative is that um, it's up to the localities to decide um, what their issue is, what they're, you know, having trouble, um, what they're having um, trouble doing and then kind of brainstorm ways to to address that issue and strategize with partners and the resources that they do have plus the resources that we have um, on how to tackle that so yes technology has come up um, but it hasn't been an area that um, any of the teams have 
focused on specifically. Um, last round of funding, they focused on mentoring programs and a lot of trauma work. Um, there were some programs related to um, key and spin, which key is an evidence-based um, program as well as DBT in real colors. So they're all very different, even though they're all part of the same initiative, um, their needs were very different. So they decided to send, uh, spend their money differently. Um, I have no idea what's gonna happen in this round. We haven't um, seen any of the applications or heard any of the ideas, um, but I am very anxious um, to see once the period closes, you know, what people have identified as issues um, and how they hope to fix them. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, well, this is the uh, really appreciate that, you know, um, I don't take silence to mean that there's, you know, <laughs> Uh, there, there is an absence of thinking, but rather there's a lot that we are considering and, uh, and particularly as a JAG, I think, you know, we have particularly this meeting. I think we have definitely filled the 3 hours with a lot of meeting information. Um, and so uh, I know I'm excited about what um, our next grants working group meeting will entail because we've got some great juicy stuff to really sort of uh, move forward to bring back to the JAG. Uh, any last comments, queries, points of clarification? All right. So um, it's a last piece of wrap up. Um, a couple of things. One is I want to say uh, I want to extend yet another welcome and excitement to our new commissioner. Uh, we're so excited to have you. Also, our new members um, love you all have, you know, you've gotten a flavor of us in terms of just jump right in um, because we're all about sort of sharing the wealth of knowledge and expertise that everybody's bringing to the table. So thank you so much for joining us to taking on this monumental, uh, exciting the JAG, as somebody who's been on here now for 11 years, um, you don't leave. No, just kidding. Um, you know, it's it's a great opportunity to kind of stay stay on board and connected to this great and amazing group of folks. Um, last thing before I ask for adjournment is uh, remind folks of our 22 um, meeting dates that are on the agenda. You should have also gotten the amazing meeting invites that Tom sends out. Uh, as somebody who lives and breathes by his calendar, I can't do anything without my calendar. Thank you so much for making sure that it lives on our calendars. Uh, uh, any uh, any other questions or thoughts or reactions? All right. I don't know if we still have quorum. To in terms of, well, uh, I'll ask. And a motion to adjourn our meeting. All right, Brendan first, uh, Michelle second. All in favor? A lot of hands up even before I ask. So I guess that's a great deal of favor. <laughs> All right, folks. Well, enjoy your what's today? Tuesday. Enjoy your Tuesday. Enjoy your holiday season. Um, and I look forward to seeing you all in the new year. Thank you so much for all your efforts. Thanks, Eddie.